Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the day two of APS Global Nurses Conference. My name is Shaisa Maharaj and I'm the Director General of APS Europe. I work as a consultant radiologist in the United Kingdom. Like yesterday, we have exciting talks by our um, renowned colleagues in the field of nursing. I welcome all the speakers and thank you for giving us your time on a Saturday. No healthcare can be delivered safely and efficiently without the dedication and support of our nurses. In today's turbulent times with economic challenges and rising inflation, we are witnessing hard times for our all healthcare professionals, including nurses. There has never been a greater need to optimize working conditions so staff can save lives of their patients. We're doing our best to highlight the healthcare issues and suggest potential solutions. Let's hope for the best. Moving on to our final day of the conference today, we will have um, uh, some educational talks followed by talks on nursing career progression, including overseas relocation and recruitment. We hope you will find these um, talks informative and inspirational. So thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Kashif Johan, uh, who is chair of Apps Europe, to say a few words. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Shaista, for uh, set, uh, giving such a nice, elaborated view of the nursing health profession. Uh, my name is uh, Kashif Chauhan, and I am the chair of uh, APPS Europe. Uh, on the behalf of APPS Global, uh, I'd like to welcome uh, all the speakers. Uh, they are very educated and honorable for us, and I'd like to invite and uh, welcome all the delegates and the participants uh, also. I'm, I, I've been involved in the health profession for the last 24 to 25 years. And what I find that I, a person like me or any person who's working in the health profession cannot work without nursing staff. If the nursing staff goes on the back foot, the health profession will collapse. Whether you're talking about physician, whether you're talk, talking about surgeons or whether you're talking about the GPs, if we do not have nursing <laughs> staff with us, if they do not take care of the patients, everything will, will collapse. So I'm very excited and I'm very thankful for all the educated, respected, honorable speakers who have joined us and all the participants and uh, I hope so that you will enjoy this conference. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to invite our first um, speaker, um, Mr. Muhammad Asghar, who is the General Secretary of All Pakistan Nurses Association, APNA UK. He's a senior ICU in charge nurse at the Royal Free NHS Hospital in London. He graduated from um, LNH Karachi in 95 and then did post RG and BSc in nurse admin and management from the Aga Khan University in 98. He then moved to United Kingdom and did specialist ICU practitioner training and a degree in critical care from King's College London in 2016. He has done extensive clinical academic and management work um, holding key positions throughout his work experience, which spreads over 30 years in various countries, including Germany. He's a director of PRO Medics International. He developed primary healthcare services in the remote rural areas of Pakistan and trained and sponsored many Pakistani nurses for work in the United Kingdom. Thank you and over to you. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Good morning and assalamu alaikum to everyone. Um, uh, and thank you very much, uh, APPS Global, to having me uh, here. And uh, I would like to thank you for arranging such a, a, a nice uh, conference so that everybody can, uh, everybody know in Pakistan and around the globe what's happening, and so that we can share and uh, our knowledge and expertise. I will go to my topics. So I'm going to talk about the ICU nursing, ICU nurse role in. Uh, uh, that is, uh, sorry, this is my topic about the ICU nursing. What is ICU nursing? Can I, uh, everybody see my slides? Um, not yet. Um, can you see the share screen button on your? Um... Uh, no, yes. Just a minute. 
Dr. Hafiz might be able to direct. Share, yeah, share a screen. Yeah, you got it. And, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Share. Yeah, role of the ICU nurse in the United Kingdom. And uh, this is my topic. Uh, can you see it now, please? Yes, we can see it. Thank you. That's it. And uh, we are, what I'm going to cover today that, uh, you know, what ICU nurse is basically and uh, how we operate in the United Kingdom and what our regulator, which is a nursing midwifery council, we call it NMC, required from us. And also, what is the role and responsibilities of a nurse working in the United Kingdom, especially the ICU nurse, and what mandatory trainings uh, we should have while working in the ICU. And also, we will look around the local and national guidelines and also about the hospital policies, protocols, and um, uh, how we implement them uh, while we are working in busy intensive care unit. Can anyone see this picture? This is my topic today. It might look very scary, but uh, believe me, you know, after when the nurse qualified and when they have a proper education, they, um, in, they are very enthusiastic early morning when we allocate the patient that to look after this type of patient. So this is, you know, all uh, intensive uh, nursing picture here. So how our ICU looks like each and every patient is this is the picture. It's a typical level three patient. I will go through with the patient's category as well. Yeah. So this is what we are expect from ICU nursing. What is ICU nursing and what we expect from a nurse here? Uh, this is the, basically the ICU nurse rule is uh, to maintain responsibility is to maintain health and life of a very sick patient uh, in the ICU setting. Uh, basic things which they need to know, and also they do early morning when they, our shift start, had to do assessment of a patient. And uh, they maintain their lives, uh, they maintain their life set health and safety while looking after this patient, looking after these life-saving equipment and also uh, using their knowledge and skills to look after that uh, patient while he is in sick. And uh, if, because that patient is very sick and also to look after the family as well who are suffering, as well as the nurse, uh, in, you know, the main other, uh, uh, you know, his um, role if sometime you know the times comes when despite everything uh, when everything fails and the patient is uh, you know uh, not recovering and how they can look after a patient when he is dying so we call it end of life care that is very important as well because this is you know part of life unfortunately it's and and part of life but that is very important as well that's what you know we expect from the nurse that they, they should be able to look after a patient while he is alive um, and also when uh, the time comes when you know all uh, he is dying so they are able to look after them uh, as as well and also respect their dignity and also look after family as well so we'll move to the, what you know ex expectations of the public and also our regulator as well as uh, uh, you know uh, our uh, you know responsibilities are so this is uh, i'm going to go through a thorough uh, understanding of implementing the individualized disciplinary and according to biophysical and psychosocial according to age specific requirements of an individual sick patient that what we expect from a nurse that they would should be implement all the uh, you know, individualized care. And also, a uh, substantial knowledge of monitoring patients is very, uh, you know, basic things which they need. And uh, they need to know what are the patient's problems are, and also needs to know what are the abnormal findings uh, with that, um, that patient having at that time. And also, they can use their knowledge, and when the times comes, how they can um, uh, escalate that one to a senior person who is working with them and also to the MDT team. That is very important because each and every nurse is, is skilled with the high knowledge 
doing their, uh, um, I will go through as well what course they need, what mandatory training need, but times comes when our knowledge are limited and then um, escalation on time is very, very important for the outcome of the patient, good outcome of the patient. And also what, and uh, next we can uh, expect that, an ability to administer specific medication on a specific time. Time is very crucial. And uh, that is what, this is very, uh, another standard which our uh, NMC, which is our regulator is required and also from the national guideline as well. A nurse should have a comprehensive knowledge of individualized patient's care. That is very important. Also another thing which is required by our regulator documentation is the very basic thing because this is basically the ICU shift is 12 hour shift. We expect that, you know, when we do any intervention, we should write it down so that if our staff, when they are coming in the evening, when we give them handover, or next day when the, someone doctors are coming, so our chart our uh, should talk about our intervention, which we did during patient, while we are looking after the patient there. That's why documentation is very important. And also record keeping, a proven record of creating an environment of safety, and also patients uh, for the only, not only for patient and also for the relatives as well, because, you know, sometimes it's very, uh, you know, we live in that environment where if we don't have a record that we have a, uh, the patient family visited and we have informed them all the uh, related patient's condition, and then the rel patient's relatives can say, oh, we, we visited there, we were not informed what is the patient current situation is at that time. That's why the record keeping our communication with patient's family is very important as well as the, uh, the our intervention for the patient. Both are having the same uh, level of, uh, you know, uh, 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 they need the same type of uh, uh, same level so that uh, it should be recorded on time. And basic thing, all, you know, the knowledge and also we uh, we discuss everything about enhance their knowledge and expertise but basic things are that patients uh, the nurse who is looking after patient should be welcoming welcoming to the in, uh, dis in multidisciplinary team welcoming to their colleagues who are visiting that family and also welcoming to the families who are very distressed at that moment and sometimes you know families um, are suffering because their loved one on the uh, in icu and the nurse is very busy with the patient sometimes if they don't give proper uh, you know uh, times and proper care to the family they become more uh, distressed so that is very important that you know we are wel welcoming them and also reassurance is very important that what we expect from our nurse that not only welcoming reassuring as well to the families so and also communicating uh, communication like i said explained before communication is very important either it's a written or verbal both communication has very important role uh, also respectful that is another thing that, you know, uh, like, uh, this is not what you say, this is how you say. At the families, when they are there, so we explain them uh, the things which should be like, you know, like I feel myself and my loved one is in ICU, I feel how I will be looked after by them. The same, we encourage nurses to, uh, you know, uh, make sure that, you know, we put ourselves in their feet and in their shoe and see how uh, we will feel if our relatives, if our loved one is in ICU. So that is very important. So despite knowledge, experience, but these basic things we expect in the United Kingdom and also around the, I hope the globe as well, the same thing. And my next slide is about Uh, you know, while working in the uh, uh, United Kingdom, we have uh, our regulator, which is, I discussed already, NMC, uh, Nursing Midwifery Council. They are, uh, have the guidelines and also we must act according to them. And also uh, an NMC code of conduct, that is very important regarding our uh, any intervention. 
and also we should be uh, following during our practice their guidelines. Uh, another guideline from the National uh, Nice Guideline, National Institute of Clinical uh, uh, Clinical Excellence, that is another national body which provide you know us guidelines how we intervene while we are working in ICU, and also intensive care society is also another our professional body which produce um, on uh, on evidence based uh, you know uh, guidelines and we need to follow them as well while we are working in the united kingdom so this is the basic uh, uh, few things which i have discussed with you but uh, i will go through uh, uh, like you know my aim is what our structure is in uh, in my icu basically so i will explain these things uh, how we operate there in uh, our uh, busy icu this is our structure. Uh, basically, the hierarchy start with director of nursing. We this is basically we don't see them on the floor much, but they are the uh, you know our director of nursing. I know everybody who know that their role, and then comes the head of nursing, and they are uh, again you know based sometime in our ITU and sometime in their offices um, um, in the main management department, and they are the head of nursing deals. Uh, four or five units like you know they are the, uh, in charge of ICU operation theater and surgical wards as well so and uh, after head of nursing our matrons role is start so the matrons are responsible uh, on uh, management role there basically and uh, uh, I won't go through their roles because I have only 20 minutes but base, um, and then band seven this is the structure and band seven is the nurse managers, and also we call them ICU practitioners. And the band six is the junior child nurse, and then band five nurses, and band four health, and also the healthcare support worker. That is our you know, structure in uh, United Kingdom. So, uh, also the day of a manager, like I, I, was, uh, I explained that, you know, when we, uh, enhance our knowledge and expertise of our, our nurse in all aspects of care. So our day start early morning with the unit handover. So the nurse who is working in the night shift, they prepare all the handover for the morning uh, start. So we then the morning nurse in charge allocate all the nurses, band five and six, band seven, only one band seven is on the shift. He allocate uh, all the nurses according to their skills, because like I explained, our junior child nurses, some are uh, new band five nurses, some are doing ICU course, some are doing ICC course. So we allocate them according to their skills. So uh, that is the band seven's responsibility. Then they go on the bad side, they take a handover. During handover, like I uh, go back again on that picture, this one, this is their handover start from each and every medication and to check the pump as well. Which medication is running? What is the concentration? So each and every shift and they uh, check what life-saving equipment we need around that bed at that, if uh, in case emergency happen. So all these check, they do one by one. And you can see that how, uh, you know, extensive handover will be. So, uh, like I said, after handover, the documentation is very important that the nurse who is taking the handover, they are signing the paper, and the nurse who is going home, they are signing the paper, so that they they are uh, they know that what they, uh, they have taken the handover, everything is right. And sometimes, if there is any discrepancies, so we have a very good system of DATEX, so that this is not blaming to anyone. This is how we can improve and how we can learn from our mistakes. So this is also duty of Kandoa as well. Like, you know, we have uh, to inform the family as well if something uh, which is, should be on the uh, right direction and if we have made any mistakes or if anything. So this is, uh, that's why the documentation is very important. And then uh, after allocation, the managers, the nurses, um, band seven, they meet um, in the office there uh, around the nursing uh, station. So here is the main, uh, 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 you know, meeting which is happening along with one matron and the band sevens. 
uh, this is an, uh, a meeting is very important that how we are gonna run theaters today and also how we are gonna take emergency admission from a &E, from the ward, and also because our hospital is tertiary uh, referral uh, tertiary care, and also we got referral from other hospital as well. So this is very important uh, nurse meeting here. On the basis of uh, our decision, this is all you you will see all our uh, since I started from meeting the doctor's name hasn't come. Doctors are very important, but this is all nurse led. So this is till this time we have not talked about the doctors at all. This is we are running ICU. Uh, with the all uh, nurses on our own. So here we look at how many book cases today we have. That's very important. Now, it's a, a, a decision is a nurse-led decision. So, okay, I will ask my colleagues that, you know, who is one, one of our colleagues is an operational manager in uh, our uh, four band sevens. One is operational manager. How many bed I can provide? How many patients are in my unit? We have four units. So, which unit is going to give us a bed. On the basis of that nurse decision that few of my patients are dischargeable and I can provide two beds on this unit, one bed on this unit, okay, four uh, booked cases are, and also we uh, on the basis of that bed availability, we say yes to the cases. And believe me that, you know, 19% uh, uh, of our cases are going ahead and we are very, very rare on un, uh, very rare uh, and uh, unfortunate circumstances when someone is off sick. Because, you know, in ICU, you know, it's one-to-one -one nursing. It's very difficult. Uh, if one nurse is, that's why we say the nursing role is very important and, uh, uh, you know, uh, on this, uh, 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 you know, platform, I would like to, you know, uh, uh, say that as well, you know, if one nurse didn't come on the shift ICU nurse, I'm uh, explaining about ICU nurse, that operation, which is might be a patient with a cancer, may be waiting for a six month, one year for his operation. And the day come today that he has uh, supposed to go for a theater. And if that nurse is uh, sick, and uh, unfortunately, that uh, case is going to be cancelled and also you know you no one knows that when his uh, next term will come so that's why you know the nurse uh, uh, icu nurse is very very important uh, play a very important role and we try our best you know uh, in all these stretch situation and busy uh, unit we try our best that all the patient cases should go ahead and also, you know, we think as a human being, we have, you know, a responsibility as well. It might be a, my dad, it might be my sister, it might be, you know, my loved one. We all human beings are the same. So that on this basis, you know, we work very hard and we make sure that, you know, and at that point, the doctor who is now we are involving, who is on call, we explain them, they look, uh, how many bed you need for emergency? He will say, "My, I need two bed. So I said, okay, four book cases and two your cases, six bed. We will provide you six bed today. And the day will start, you know, um, uh, we can start, go ahead. And the theater, they were waiting anxiously about our ICU call that, you know, how many patients can go ahead? And, you know, the smile when we say all cases can go ahead, just smile on their face and, you know, the, the and the family and the patients, because, you know, uh, they uh, at that time is a very crucial time and everybody you know take it uh, that if we say yes to all everybody is happy and so that you know the aim our aim is to relieve everybody's pain and agony and operation should go ahead so sorry i will be uh, quick uh, then we, our ward round is start with uh, you know one nurse in charge uh, start ward round with uh, our consultant uh, usually, you know, for uh, two or three registrar as well, and some junior trainees doctor as well. So they do the uh, ward round and uh, they uh, uh, put some, uh, you know, <clears throat> their comments about the treatment. What main aim is they go and ask the nurse. So what are the, uh, you know, uh, uh, how is the situation of the patient? What are the problems? What are suggestions? What do you think how we can work here? That is very, uh, you know, encouraging to the nurse, giving empowerment that, you know, the nurse, you tell us what we are going to do and how, you know, your patient is doing. The nurse explained what are, you know, requirements are, how the patient is doing. The doctor assess as well. So on the basis, you know, we set up our daily goal. 
you know, what is the, uh, you know, plan for a day. And uh, uh, on that basis, the, after the war round, then uh, um, uh, the nurse in charge responsibility is as well that the target which has been set today, I make sure that at the end of my shift, all targets are met. If in between, if the targets are not, we are not uh, reaching at that target, what else, what intervention we can do and some are nurse led because all the, and um, some are like, you know, uh, like I explained that I have developed some uh, protocol as well on my previous hospital in Webscraft University Hospital while patient is up very sick, how we can uh, uh, resuscitate with fluids. And uh, uh, so these are protocols, some uh, guidelines are already there, which is nurse led. So we don't uh, call the doctors, we intervene and according to that, uh, to achieve that plan. And uh, if uh, uh, we, despite this one, then I, uh, like I explained that escalation on time is very important in ICU. Time is very crucial, you know, every minute and every second counts. So that's why we request the nurse to escalate to me ASAP. And if I can't resolve the situation, we escalate to the consultant, um, the registrar uh, ASAP so that the problems can be solved uh, uh, ASAP. And then, you know, we do the breaks for all, um, it's my duty, like a health and safety. Uh, in uh, the employer has the duty to provide all the equipment necessary to look after the patient in ICU. And then the employee's responsibility to uh, use these all equipments accordingly, to use their knowledge skills, and also uh, looking after them and really uh, give them time for a food is my responsibility as well. So that's why I make sure that, you know, before I take my break, my old nurses, who are on duty, they have their proper breaks. Okay. And then we have a bed meeting in which in the middle of the day, what target we have set early morning, are we achieving it? Are there is, you know, like a doctor said, okay, I need two emergency bed. If there is any more emergency, what we can do? And then we go around and which patient is uh, uh, likely to go to the ward? If he's not ready now, how he can be ready till evening? So we have a proper, you know, full backing from our matrons and also from our you know, ICU colleagues uh, and multidisciplinary team as well. We call the doctor who is looking after that. If, for example, surgical patient, we call them, look, we need, a, uh, you know, to, you, we need you here to come and uh, you know, uh, assess your patient. He might be able to go to the ward. And then they are very, it's like a, it's a teamwork. And uh, believe me, you know, it's a very good teamwork. And they come and they know that because their patient is in the theater, and uh, if he is ready to go to the ward and then, uh, you know, uh, uh, we make another bed. So, so that the person who need ICU bed, he should not be uh, waiting for ICU bed. And then, you know, staff uh, arrangement allocation again for the night shift is the person who is a, a operational manager on that day. He is responsible for, uh, you know, uh, arranging the shift and also staff for the next coming shift. So, and uh, that is our uh, daily, you know, day, daily uh, day and uh, our uh, uh, day end with the uh, handover from our, uh, you know, the coming team in the night. And also again, the day we, uh, the, we started early morning, like, you know, taking handover and going for the meeting, nurse goes to uh, check patients, uh, all necessary equipment and the night shift is start the same pattern is in ICU, there is no day and night. Both is a care of level and uh, staffing is the same. And the data, uh, I have, uh, you know, uh, look at night shift last night about the ICU mortality rate. And uh, it, it depends on, on uh, from specialty, you know, different specialty, like we are liver ICU specialist and also general uh, patient as well. In, in 2022, uh, the, in 21 and 22, the ratio was 31.9% mortality rate. And it, uh, according to um, uh, that is, you know, uh, that, uh, uh, that is our audit for ICNAR, it's, it's not in car, it's ICNAR, is a 41%. And also in the liver ICUs is like a 27 to 48% according to criticalforumbiomedical.com. And uh, thank you very much indeed. That is, uh, you know, about our, our ICU nursing. Any questions, please, you're most welcome. 
Many thanks for that. Uh, so um, it's important, as you said, to be proactive, looking for the problems and planning ahead. And bed situation obviously is critical in any um, uh, healthcare settings. And communication, of course, is very important, how you communicate with your staff, with your colleagues, and with the patients and their relatives. Thank you for that. And um, Dr. Hafiz is having some questions for you. Yeah, thank, thank you, Asghar Bhai. Um, obviously, excellent presentation. Uh, we are very proud that you are, um, you know, one of Pakistani doctors leading uh, an ICU in one of the main hospitals in London. Um, this is a great achievement. There are a few questions which have come through. Um, obviously, you, you mentioned um, that you are obviously dealing with patients and their relatives. Yeah. And we know how sick patients are when they are in intensive care unit. How do you alive? You know, it's a really difficult thing when things are going in the wrong direction. Well, I mean, how do you deal with patients, families um, in, in that situation? It's very good question, sir. Thank you very much. It's very important. There, at that time, sir, uh, you know, the uh, religious beliefs uh, cultural and norms comes first. So you have to deal each and every patient according to their beliefs, according to their norms and values. So uh, this situation gets worse when uh, a nurse or a doctor does not, uh, you know, uh, look after these three aspects. So my, um, you know, my, uh, I'm, um, you know, advice to all these uh, colleagues who are listening, my, uh, you know, uh, conversation here that these if you look after these three aspects the uh, your communication goes very well and you won't uh, you know uh, uh, be like you know get some surprises we approach them sir according to their uh, religious beliefs look if the muslim uh, patient comes here my, i am uh, you know mostly in charge nurse goes with the consultant to explain to them what is the situation like you know uh, I explain them like, you know, you know, everyone uh, has to die one day. I am going to die as well, but I don't know when. So we all need to prepare. We are doing very, everything what we can do. And, you know, uh, our Prophet um, um, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed away. And, you know, he is not in this world. And, you know, it same like, you know, everybody has to die at one day. We are uh, doing everything what we can do. And, uh, but if sometimes the machine and doesn't work because that when the times will come, so no one can, uh, you know, beyond their expectations. So we have not stopped anything for your relatives. He is still on life-saving drugs. All um, the ventilator machines are working, but unfortunately the patient's condition is instead of getting better, it's getting worse. So this is how we approach them. And also, like I said, the uh, when we intubate the patient, the weaning time is start the same day because our aim is we are intubating the patient when we are going to extubate the same day we uh, you know uh, start communication with the patient and uh, with the uh, ex of course patient is intubated but we still explain it to them that you are having tube in your mouth we are going to take it same things are we communicate with the family that look we have done tube today that is life saving drugs has started you are most welcome to call anytime we have proper visiting time as well everyday communication and explaining to them on daily basis and that makes life easy when you explain them at the end time that they are fully in the picture okay thank you the, the, and the next question which we have got is <clears throat> regarding the guidelines you mentioned you know you mentioned nice guidelines and guidelines for the intensive care society okay. are these guidelines useful for you know, intensive cares outside UK, for example, somebody in the Middle East, can they use the same guidelines? Or, that's very or for good. example, in Pakistan? That's very, that's very good question, sir. I visited, uh, you know, uh, uh, last year in Pakistan, and I was surprised, you know, that uh, the result for the COVID uh, with the, what they have done, very good work. And it was amazing. And it was uh, like, you know, having less resources and, you know, giving such a big, uh, good result it was amazing. So we live in a material world, sir. In the UK, we can manage and we can use all nice guidelines and uh, you know our ICS guidelines. And then after this guideline, we have hospital 
uh, policies and protocols despite you know these sometimes these guideline guidelines are guidelines they are you know they are the guidelines they are like when patient actual situation sometime you know you have to do something different so uh, following these guidelines sometime you do uh, different intervention because this is material world we can uh, 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 you know uh, uh, have uh, all machinery, all equipment, it, you know, uh, uh, from A to Z, what you need it. Then we can follow it here. But in other world, like in Pakistan, it's not, uh, you know, I see guidelines here, one-to-one -one nursing. But in Pakistan, in other countries, how you can achieve this target? You know, it, they, they need to look after the patient according to their, you know, uh, need that according to their resources there, because, you know, it's very important. If you don't have ventilators there, patient, I have witnessed myself and actually the relatives are doing the, you know, life-saving support to them. They are begging the patient, they are, you know, <clears throat> doing ventilator work with their hands. In this country, you can't see that one, but it's amazing patient, sur patient survives there as well. So, and uh, same like I give example here that, you know, we are chemical, we are material world, we give chemical here, like we say, it's a, like a chemical, someone is, uh, you know, waking up and also uh, uh, unable to follow commands and he's agitated, we give them propofol, this is chemical. So in Pakistan, we don't give chemical, we, this is in this country that will call physical abuse, we ask the relatives to hold the hand. Or we tie them with the, you know, they, they not me, they, they, I have witnessed that they tie them with the, you know, some proper gloves and something. So, and also I see that the other side of that uh, uh, holding hands are talking with the families. When they discharge from the ICU, they have like the less side effects of these sedated medication as compared to our patient who was sedated, ventilated for a long period of time. And when you try to wake them up, it takes long time. And other side, you know, when they don't have resources, is a from the, another gift from the God <clears throat> that it's not a gift, but it's a, like you know another uh, when you don't have resources, you know, God provides some uh, alternative. So that's why they have le less time to stay in ICU as compared to uh, you know first one. Thank you. Thank you. I think the last question. Uh, which we received is regarding this nurse-led ICUs. Because, yeah. I mean, can you tell us more in terms of how nurses lead? Because normal international concept is, is always consultant leading the ICUs. So, uh, 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 that's a very good question, sir. Thank you very much indeed. So we work together, sir, as a team. Uh, we, uh, like, you know, it's not concept that uh, the doctor is leading the ICU. Basically, the nurse in charge is leading the unit at that day and along, working along with the consultant. So that is because the nurse is 24 hours there, the nurse in charge. And uh, after the ward round, he has made that uh, suggestions. And also our nurse in charge duty is to make sure that the plan which was uh, uh, given and carried out in the morning. And also when we are like, you know, early morning, when we do the meetings, doctor has their separate meeting. Like we know, I explained that we have a meeting there that in uh, after the handover, the doctors have separate meeting. Our matron sometimes go, uh, uh, most of them, they goes there to meet them. And the matron comes to in our meeting to feedback what's happening there, how many doctors they are there, how many consultants there because most do doctors are junior doctors. And uh, I am glad that, you know, the senior doctor, they uh, know our expertise and our knowledge. They request the doctors, please ask any question to the nurse in charge. So when they see the senior nurse, the concert and become happy, oh, are you are on the duty today? My day will go very well. And then he referred to junior doctors and register, please, any problems, anything, go to the nurse in charge. And also uh, they ask the junior nurses as well, consultant that, you know, when you have any issues, please call to the nurse in charge rather than going to my registrar. And so this is, and also the bed is under control of a nurse. If the nurse is in charge of the beds there, consultant is not in charge. If the consultant say, okay, my bed is ready to go to the ward, we, uh, <clears throat> our nurses are well is, is skilled, equipped, and also they say, no, patient is not ready to go to the ward because I don't think so patient will deal there. So the is, uh, uh, doctor cannot discharge the patient without the nurse uh, consultation. 
And if the nurse is not happy, doctor 100% agree with us. And also we decide which patients, what time they're going to go and when, what time they're ready. And then we ask the consultant that, okay, my patient is ready to go. Are you happy if you have more? Sometimes, uh, you know, our knowledge is uh, like, you know, uh, limited as well. So there's underlying cause, which where we can see the patient is, you know, uh, my nurse can see the patient is well and poor, but there's underlying cause, which came in CT scan and uh, MRI, which I have not seen it yet. They have seen it. They said, no, there is something we can, um, uh, stay today, you think that the patient is ready, but not. It's like a team work. We don't work under any consultant and anyone. This is, you know, like basically the nurse may take the decision for each and every aspect of care. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Dr. Um, Kashif Shohan has a quick question before we yeah, move yeah, please, to our next speaker. Thank you. Uh, uh, Saab, that, that is a very good, you know, description of the ICU. It's uh, very mesmerizing the way you people hold the ICU, you know, fort. I've got two simple questions and I just need a brief answer for those, you know, uh, question. First question is that once you qualified as a nurse, what extra training or education or courses you need to do in order to be on the floor of ICU? Because that's a very specialized floor. And my exactly. And my, my second question is that what is what are the progress aspects of an ICU nurse as compared to the floor nurse? Um, floor nurse, I mean the ward nurse or the theater's nurse. So if you can just give us a brief answer for these two questions. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. It's a very good question, sir. I wanted to add in my slides these two things as well, but because of the time limits. So I didn't uh, wrote it down. That is very good question, sir. For a ICU nurse, sir, it's very important that post um, uh, 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 qualification they should have a two years experience in uh, uh, surgical wards or medical wards, uh, and then they come to ITU. We welcome them. It's a six, uh, four to six weeks introduction period for them, and then we uh, arrange our ICC course um, uh, for them, which is a. Uh, 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 that is intensive care, uh, like uh, introduction course, introduction to critical care. We call it ICC. Within a six month, they have to have a, that course. After that six month, after their result, they are you know uh, they will go for critical care course, which is called ICU specialist practitioner course or ICU course. We call it. So two uh, we, they can uh, uh, because we expect that nurse within a one year they should do the ICU course. So this is the second thing. And the two uh, course they need ICC and ICU course. Then we in in-house we have a liver course. The people, because we are liver specialist hospital, they have a liver course uh, one year, nine months to one year. Uh, they are special trainings. For th this is your first uh, uh, questions answer. And for uh, uh, career progression, sir, we have a CPET, we call clinical practice educator. They are the very important people in our team. They are the people who comes and um, help us to train these nurses because uh, clinical practice educators are the one who uh, interview the nurses. They bring them for, uh, you know, introduction to the ICU. They do the IC, they are the, uh, you know, uh, 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 responsible for their ICC course, ICU course. And each, every band seven, like me, I'm a manager there. I have a 30 staff and we have a two band seven, two manager for 30 staff. We are responsible for doing their appraisal for their um, uh, career progression. And uh, we set up an action plan. Every month, each and every band seven has a, a management day in which we uh, uh, go through each and every person's progression. We set up a plan for each and every individual and who are very weak, we set up again plan to work one-to-one -one with the CPE, clinical practice educator. So this is how they progress. And also we sponsor them for a, a degree in ICU again, and also MSc program. And also if they want to do as a practitioner, they can do advanced practitioner as well. And all um, NHS sponsoring them. Thank you very much. I think the opportunities are endless if you want to come to this career pathway. Thank you yeah. for that. I'm going to go to a lot of 50,000 nurses we need in UK and I, you know, encourage and from this platform to, you know, please to a male should come forward, do the, I, um, you know, nursing in Pakistan and do specialized courses. And we are here to help 
to enhance their knowledge and skill in all uh, aspects of nursing. And we are happy to go to Pakistan as well to help them so that they should be ready to work anywhere in the world, not in the United Kingdom. If you have a nursing degree, my colleagues, listen, if you have a nursing degree, you have an international passport. So, you know, you don't need to worry, you know, you will get a job in Pakistan and entire world, they are waiting for you. So this is very good opportunity from this platform, you know, listen, and if any Dr. Hafiz is there, I am here, and you have my, you know, Dr. Hafiz has my email and phone, and you are most welcome, any, uh, you know, we are uh, there to help. Thank you very much. So there you have your answer. If you have your nursing degree, you can just spread your wings and go anywhere and do anywhere anything. in the world. Yeah. And we are here to support you and guide you. Yes. Um, yes. Thank you, Mohammad um, Asghar. If you could kindly stop sharing your screen. And our next speaker is Minhaj Chaudhary. He's a budding young doctor with a promising career ahead of him, I'm sure. He's in the process of doing the medical licensing examinations to work in the United Kingdom. He graduated in 2021 from Rawalpindi um, Medical University, Pakistan, and took the um, OAT, which is the language examination, English language examination for healthcare professionals um, the same year. Thank you for joining us today and giving us your time. If you can kindly unmute yourself. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Can you all hear me? clearly absolutely and we can see your slides as well okay so thank you for having me here today uh, thank you dr Rafis, for inviting me so today i will be uh, uh, guiding you how to prepare for the oet and the structure of oet examination so firstly the question we have is what is oet so it's occupational english english test it is specifically designed for healthcare professionals so uh, in comparison to the IELTS, which is general English examination, in OET, we only have scenarios related to the uh, medical professional or healthcare environment. So it is better for you know, people who are associated with the healthcare profession. And uh, after that, uh, the important thing is what, uh, where, who can take the OET? So anyone in the healthcare profession uh, related to nursing, dentistry, medicine, occupational therapy, all can take this examination and it is accepted in a number of healthcare bodies, including UK and Ireland, Australia, and including uh, UAE. So all the healthcare bodies that accept English as their first language, they accept the OET examination. Okay, so the important thing, the structure of this test, so in this test, there are four domains where you will be tested. So these four domains are listening, reading, writing, and speaking. So you have to pass, pass all these four domains to clear the test. In case you fail any of the domain, you will have to reset the exam. Okay, so first of all, we have listening subtest. In this subtest, we have three parts. So the first part we have, uh, there will be two consultation conversations going on. So they will give you the headphones in the exam and the consultation will be going on and you will listen to the audio. And simultaneously, you will have to answer the questions on the sheet that you are provided. So these are in the part A, we have fill in the blanks kind of questions. And they usually have 42 questions for this subtest. And in the part A, you have 24 questions. And after that, we have the part B of this listening subtest. In this part, we have six short dialogues going on, and you will have to simultaneously uh, choose the correct multiple choice answer. And after that, we have part C. And in this part, there will be two, uh, either it will be a presentation or it will be an interview going on. So it's going to be a monologue. So one person is going to be speaking throughout this part and you will have to answer the question simultaneously according to that so if i can share the so i will try to show you the listening part how it looks in the exam 
Let me share the screen. Is it the is it a video you are trying to share? No, no, it's just the. Uh, okay. So I think you paper. Have to... I think I just have ten minutes, so I think I don't have time to share the question paper. So I will just guide you through the structure, and uh, basically all this material is uh, available free on the OET website. So in case anyone wants to see how the question paper looks, they can familiarize themselves with that on the OET website. So uh, if I had more time, uh, I would surely do that. So after that, we have reading subtest. It takes 60 minutes. And like the listening subtest, we have uh, 42 questions in this uh, part two. In the part A, we have uh, four short text. Okay, And after those four short texts, we have to answer 20 questions. These are also fill in the blank type of questions. And in part B, we have six short paragraphs and we have to answer one mcq question for each paragraph and in part c like the part c of listening we have uh, an essay or a presentation and we have to read that and accordingly we have to answer the questions uh, this contains 16 questions and after that we have writing subtest so the most uh, important one in this exam is the writing one because most of the people who fail this exam is because of this writing subtest. As a subtest, you can actually practice at home on yourself, but the, for the writing subtest, you need someone to grade your uh, writing tasks so you know how well you are scoring on your writing task. So uh, for anyone who is taking the OET, I will suggest yet that you uh, focus a lot on this part, the writing subtest. So in this subtest, you will be given 45 minutes. And for the first five minutes, you have to read the question and see what you have to do. And they will give you the instructions. And for the next 40 minutes, you have to complete the task. Basically, in this task, you either have a discharge letter, uh, in the like we have the discharge letter in the NHS hospitals, and refer letter from a GP to a consultant. Or uh, in case of nursing, we have a, discharge, a refer letter from an a nurse to another doctor so you will be given your task and you have to write accordingly and there are also transfer letters for uh, transferring a patient from icu to a ward or from a ward to another ward so uh, they will give you the task and you have to write that in 180 200 words and you will get 45 minutes for this and after that we have speaking subtest in this subtest we have 20 minutes so what happens is in the first three or four minutes, they will uh, inter they will ask you to introduce yourself. And so, you know, they will try to calm your nerves and get you ready for the actual uh, test. And after that, you will be given two role play cards. So in these role play cards, uh, the examiner sitting next to you basically will act as a patient or a colleague, and you will be given your role play card where you will be a nurse or a, you know doctor in case of OET we have to give and uh, you will be given your task that you have asked the patient about uh, the reason for coming here and give them all the management steps and all that. So you will have your uh, instructions on your card and the other person will have their instructions. So uh, there will be actually two role play cards. So three uh, minutes will be given for preparation. So you read your role play card and see what you, are, you need to ask according to that. And after that, you will have five minutes to complete your task given in that card. So for nursing in the UK, you need to have more than 350 in three subtests. In the writing, you only need more than 300. So uh, if you're going, uh, taking UET, uh, OET for working in UK, uh, you need only 300 plus in writing. That's, I think, uh, is easily achievable if you give it uh, like two weeks of preparation that can easily be done. And, uh, but for the other three subtests, you need more than 350. So you will need to do some practice to get that. So uh, here was the structure. And after that, how you can prepare for this examination effectively. So first of all is you have to familiarize yourself with the structure of the exam. So you have to know how, what you're gonna do in the, exam on the exam day. So after familiarizing yourself with the structure, you have to see what your target score is. As I explained earlier, that you need 350 plus in three subtests and 300 plus in writing. So you know that you need this much score in the examination. 
after that what i suggest is you take a free mock there are free mocks available on oit website or these three study material uh, benchmark website e2 language website they have free mocks available so you can take those mocks and you can see that what your score right now is so you know how much you need to improve to get to your to the target score that you need for the exam so uh, for the purpose of preparation for speaking and listening you actually don't need anyone's help you can do those at home there are free study materials available you can uh, complete your task in the given time and you can uh, evaluate yourself and see how much you scored so those two are really easy to practice at home for the speaking part you need someone with some experience so they can role play with you and tell you how much improvement you need so this can be this can either be a colleague who has already passed oit exam or some people also opt for academies or online subscriptions to prefer for the examination so if you think that you need some uh, online guidance or coaching professional coaching with this examination you can maybe opt for a subscription or academy too but uh, i think this examination is quite easy and you can pass it without any paid subscription and with the help of free material available online so for the writing task you need to for the writing task the main thing is that you need to uh, practice the uh, like 10 or 15 referral letters and transfer uh, letters they have in the preparation material available so you practice those and you ask someone uh, you know with some experience to evaluate those letters for you so that's how you can prepare for this examination and uh, especially this e2 language they have a really good youtube channel and uh, they have most of the things available for free so you can watch those videos and they are he really helpful in the examination they really helped me in my examination so i hope they help you too thank you so any questions anyone want to ask many thanks for giving us a comprehensive summary um if you could kindly stop sharing the screen and can I request you to share those links in the chat box? Yes, uh, I will show you the links. Yeah. No Great. It, it's for everyone. If you click on everyone, then they can have a look. And this E2, E2 language YouTube um, link as well. Thank yes. you. Dr. Hafiz has um, a comment to make. Gee, thank you. I think the, as we all know, English language is quite a tough exam and especially for um, those people who haven't had much experience of obviously speaking and uh, you know studying in English and so on. So we know a lot of nurses are struggling. So as an organization, what I would offer is that if you are struggling with the exam, please contact us and we will provide you tuition from UK free of charge. Um, so spread the word. If anybody need any help, do contact us uh, on the professional forum. I know and all of our colleagues from nurses background will tell us that it is extremely difficult for nurses but if this is the only hindrance in your career progression, then as UK will do everything, we will provide English language expert tutors who, will, who can teach you virtually from here. Thank you. That's excellent. And I think that's a major barrier uh, for a lot of people uh, who want to come abroad from Pakistan. And believe me, it's not a big deal. A lot of uh, non-English speaking nurses come from across the world. And they all are learning. So it's not something that you are more than you have more talent than you can imagine and more um, potential than you, you actually are aware of, um, to be honest. Now, the next speaker is uh, Mohammed Yasin, who is the director. Sorry. Sorry, can I, I just want to. Say thank you very much, Dr. Hafiz, for your offer for the nurses' family, and we will, uh, you know, escalate to all of our nurses who are struggling in Pakistan. Thank you very much, APPSU. Thank, thank you. So, um, Mohammed Yasin is the director of Infection Prevention and Control (IPC) at Bradford NHS Hospital in UK. His work experience spans over 25 years. He obtained his primary nursing qualification from LNH Karachi in '95 and was the first nurse from South Asia to pass the American and Canadian board exam in infection control in 2001. In 2003, Dr. Yasin obtained a bachelor's degree in infection control from the UK and then moved to the USA to do master's in healthcare administration 
and later a PhD in um, IPC from South Africa, Hans doc the doctor. He has worked as WHO advisor for the East Mediterranean region, and he has published his work in international scientific journals and have given talks at international conferences across the world. Many thanks for being here today and um, over to you. If you could unmute yourself, thank you. And uh, you can start sharing your screen if you have slides, thanks. Thank you, thank you Shaista and thank you Dr. Hafiz for giving me the chance and uh, uh, thanks to one of my best friends, Sheikh Hussain as well, who uh, actually had uh, spoke with Dr. Hafiz and I was given the chance indirectly through Sheikh Hussain as well. Uh, uh, I, I, I was thinking of making a scientific presentation, but then I thought in 20 minutes, if I make a scientific presentation, I can't convey any important message, although I can just, just show my uh, scientific knowledge and that will be show off more than more than sharing the knowledge. So I, I don't have a scientific presentation like Asghar Bhai that was highly scientific and very impressive as well. And uh, uh, so I have... Uh, can I ask you to um, stop sharing your screen then if you don't have any slides because... No, no, I have it. I have it. But, have but it. Then... I, yeah, you have to um, select that. Uh... I'm coming, back. I'm, I'm coming yeah. to that. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. It's fine. Yeah. So, so I, that, that, that's it. So I, I thought of a scientific presentation, but then I thought uh, the only thing I want to share here is the problem that we have is the perception of nursing, uh, especially in Pakistan, um, Middle East as well, but Pakistan. The perception is the biggest problem where the, where the nurses are, are perceived as the subservient of the, the doctors. And so I, I have a little clip, movie clip to show you. If, if you can hear, probably you will, but, but uh, let me try anyway. ਕਿਵੇਂ <laughs> 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 So that's just, that's just an indication of what the perception is in our in our in our country, especially in Pakistan, what people perceive nurse to be. Uh, this is Punjabi. I'm sorry about that, but the jo Punjabi nahi samajhte na, to unke liye bhi hai ki wo kare. Tumne tikka bhi khud kaun sa lagana hai? Jaake doctor ko hi pakhana hai. So this perception, uh, how can change? How can we change that? And please write in your comments or questions that whether you think that this perception is wrong, that, that people think differently now. Uh, I'm not in Pakistan and many years outside. So if you, if you can just put in comments that the perception has changed now, the general public thinks of nurses, nurses uh, and like independent practitioners now, they will be very happy to know that as well. But my personal opinion is that Till the, the general public, the, the, the people who are not related to healthcare, their perception still is the, the nurse to be the, to be just the followers of the physician or the doctor, whatever the doctor's order are, they just follow that. They, they don't have their own initiatives. So, so this is this is our CEO in my hospital. I, will, I work in Bradford in, in Bradford Teaching Hospital, the NHS Trust. So this is our CEO, Mel Pickup. She's she's basically a nurse. So so uh, she she is a nurse. So how, how about she? If it, if I tell her that's what people think in Pakistan or India that a nurse can't even give an injection herself. So uh, this is just just to share with you the big range of perception and the reality that a nurse can become a CEO or the chief executive. But people think that they can't can even give an injection without doctor's prescription or, or, or any medication. Can you hear me properly? Yes, absolutely. You're very thank clear. You. Thank you. Thank you. Now, this is just, this is just to show you that who I am. Uh, so I'm Dipsy as well. Uh, so when I joined the trust here th three months ago, uh, and the uh, other Dipsy, Director of Infection Prevention Control. So in, in, in the UK, especially in England, we are called Dipsy. And if anybody knows the cartoons, the Teletubbies, so there are Dipsy, Dipsy and, and, and others. So the, the green one is Dipsy. So when Claire Chadwick was retiring, who I replaced, so on her retirement day, uh, our boss, she's wearing the Dipsy dress and, and there's a Dipsy. So this, this Dipsy is in my office as well. 
So any even any time you hear Dipsy, so we are the Dipsies in England, Director of Infection Prevention Control. Right. So when I was talking about that uh, uh, perception that that a nurse can't give an injection even or, or they they can't do anything, so then I remembered my friend Sheikh Hossein, who's an advanced nurse practitioner. So uh, once again, I thought uh, how how different we think and what the reality is. Look at the reality. He can examine the patient, he can assess them, he can make diagnosis, he can treat them, he can prescribe medications even, and he can refer them to, 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 to a tertiary career. So uh, this, is, this is the gap that we need to fill. And we need to make sure that, that the understanding of the nursing profession uh, is, 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 in, is, is penetrated into our society, into our people, and, and then not, not by their mistake, but why they think this way is what they see. So if anybody goes to a hospital in Pakistan, so they will see the nurse only, and they will see and see the nurse mostly coming with with the prescription or, or 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 a medication, and say, okay, this is what the doctor wrote, and they come with the doctor, and the doctor is making the round. So this is what the perception they get. I'm not blaming them. This is the perception they get. But however, any patient who comes to Sheikh Hussain in 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 his clinic. And he comes there. He, he he only has a chance to see Sheikh Hussain. He he's diagnosed there. He's given prescription. He, he everything that that happens to the patient happens with with Sheikh Hussain. They don't see doctor at all. So that's where the perception changes. That that, that means the nurse can do all this. So, so the nurses are not just just following the doctors. So that is where we can change the perception to to go into our clinical advanced practices rather than just just. Uh, staying in the profession as, as a, a simple uh, practitioner so i don't know i can't see some of the some of the content underneath but can you see the full slide sorry one minute yes we can see up to the research tab so i okay. think that's perfect. yeah perfect uh, so uh, so so these are these are the pillars of advanced practice so why i'm saying you need to have advanced practice so in the advanced practice you have all these pillars so you have clinical practice, so that you can you can move into this module, or and then you you can progress through clinical practice and become advanced clinical practitioner as well. You can go into the leadership and management role, so you do further management leadership courses, and you can become leader. And as I said, our CEO is a nurse basically as well. And there are many other examples as well. You can do into it, go into education, so so you can become an educationist, and, and so that's another another way of progressing your career. And then the research, so so these are the four main pillars of our our, our, our progression where we we can, we can progress. This uh, new one is not new anymore, and this is the nursing informatics. This is very, very uh, uh, attractive career. Uh, anybody who who wants to go into digital uh, world, and, and as you know, and, and almost every hospital in the UK or advanced countries or in the Middle East as well has digital records. The medical records are, are digital now. You have you have electronic record. There are no more files or papers or everything. So it is becoming more and more important to have have specialist people who are in, who are specialists in, in in informatics. So so the nursing informatics is another one. One of my brother's friend he he just asked my advice last week, and he he, he wants to do a master. So he asked me what he he should choose. So so personally, I gave him the the, the, the my opinion that that if he wants to go into a modern and in the field or, or wants to choose something modern this this is the future the future is in informatics so that's another one people can choose nursing informatics we can go to healthcare quality so that's not purely nursing profession uh, but there are people who, who join healthcare quality there are different courses you can do different uh, certificates so either you're a nurse or, or a physician or, or any other any other profession you can still do for healthcare quality courses and you, you can join the healthcare quality uh, and the one that obviously that's me infection prevention control is another one uh, where uh, uh, and, and as Shaista already mentioned in my in my uh, introduction, I was the first one uh, in, in, in Pakistan who uh, had the American board exam, uh, not only Pakistan, but in the South Asia at that time, and not only the nurse, 
So, so any profession. So the CBIC, and I will mention in the next slide, the, the American board exam uh, is for everyone. It, it's for physicians, it's for nurses, it's for pharmacists, it's for everyone. And, it, it, and it's the same exam. So I was the first one in 2001 who passed that exam. So you can go into infection control as well. As that's another another uh, domain you, you can choose. And as I showed you my picture of Dipsy, so you can become director of infection prevention control as well. Uh, and uh, the, the, still in the Middle East, you can't even imagine that you will be a director of uh, infection control as a nurse, uh, as non non physician, as non doctor. Same with Pakistan, I think. Uh, but in the UK now, there are nurses also who are dipsies, uh, not not many. But uh, uh, then I, I feel very grateful and, and thankful to Allah that I'm one of those who, who is the director of infection prevention control. So this is this is a, a role which which uh, is the decision making roles and all the decisions uh, are made by the dipsies. Uh, so there, there's no uh, physician uh, guidance or involvement or anything. So we have infection control doctors with us, and uh, but however the decisions are made by the dipsies. So if you want to want to go into the infection prevention control. And domain or the field, what, what can you do? So there are two different uh, uh, pathways you can take. If uh, in North America, like US, Canada, so they, they, they call it CIC, and there's a, there's a board which is called CBIC, Certification Board of Infection Prevention Control. So uh, that exam is a certification exam. So the, so the first exam is taken as, as the computerized exam. So there are almost 150 questions that you have to take. So it's a proctored exam. Uh, and then you have to pass that exam to, to call CIC and you can write CIC with your, with your name as credential. So uh, that, that's America, Canada, they have the same board. So if you if you can pass that CIC, you are a, a certified practitioner for, for, for infection control and you can work anywhere and you, 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 are, you are eligible to, 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 be, said, to, to, to be the practitioner for, for infection control. In the Europe and in other countries, it's a little different. And, and the, the, you have uh, certificates, you have diplomas, you have bachelor's degree, master's degree, PhD. So I was a little more ambitious, so I, I said I will take both. So I did my CIC, as I said, in 2001. Uh, and, and at the same time, I took my degree as well from one of the universities in, 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 in the UK, Dundee University in Scotland. So after that, uh, I didn't stop there. So I did my PhD as well. So, so for PhD, not many universities provide a uh, PhD in infection control, but one of the universities in South Africa I found uh, and, uh, that that was one where I could, could, could get enrolled. So it took me seven years anyway. Uh, but however, Alhamdulillah, by the grace of Allah, I, and I completed in 2019. So that's what that, so if you are in the Middle East or in Pakistan, it depends on what the standards the hospital is, is, is following. So, for example, my hospital where I worked last 14 years in, in, in Saudi Arabia, they, they were following the, the, the North American standard. So, so the CIC was one of the requirements if you want to, to be an infection control practitioner or a person. But if you are in some other hospitals where they follow European standards or, or, or British standards, you can have your diplomas and degrees. And then now in Saudi Arabia as well, there are some universities which are which are providing even up to masters in infection prevention control. So it's up to you what, what, what pathway you want to choose. But how However, so then if you want to progress your career in infection control, you can do that. So at the end, I, I thought I would just put some innovations by nurses. So, so and these are the nurses. And, and we, we should be grateful to them. That the, the, the crash card, for example, is, is Asagar Bhai, and we will tell you how important this can be to save somebody's life. So the crash card in 1968, Anita Doe was the nurse who, who actually brought the concept of the crash card at that time. And the neonatal phototherapy, you know, this is very famous. Even, even general public knows that if your child has your, your neonate or, the, or infant has as John Dish. So if you take them to the sunlight and so phototherapy, so and then they, they can cure that. So she's the first one in 1950. And then when she took the child outside and she, she, she brought the child in and she found that any, any part of the body which was covered uh, with the cloth were, was still yellow or, or more yellow than the, the, the other parts of the body which were, which were exposed. So that's how the concept of phototherapy came, therapy came in. No ostomy, an ostomy bag, as you know, very, very important thing. So anybody uh, who is suffering from this, they would tell you how, how, how helpful that this can be. So she had a sister who, who was uh, having colostomy and all. And the, the, the problem was the smell and, and everything. So she created something, a bag like this. And that's the, the concept ostomy bag came in from there. Uh, but I, I thought I'll talk about some some other concept or new innovations as well. So this is the old way of cleaning, as you know, mopping and everything. 
but uh, how about this? If we can have this, I think it will be very, very helpful. So you can clean your house or floor and, and the child is also happy. Thank you. Thank you very much. I like that last costume. I have a nine months old son, so I'll definitely think about that. Um, thank you for this wonderful presentation. And I think the perception hasn't changed, but it is changing. And this is where we come. Uh, Mohammad Daskar is just saying that perception is unfortunately still the same in Pakistan, but of course, training and skills can change that. And uh, um, if you ask me, I, I worked in Pakistan and, and then I came to UK and I think nurses always had my back and that's how I felt safe in the ward. They are the ones who are the, with the patient all the time and they can pick up subtle things which we can oversee sometimes. So if you are, uh, if you have to progress, if you have to feel safe working in a team, nurse is the key person and um, never undermine yourself. You you are the most important person on a ward round and you, you lead and you decide things and uh, it's with the communication and working as a team and respecting our colleagues as um, in a professional way that we can deliver safe and efficient um, care. No, I agree with you, Shasta, if I may add that. Add that. So, so, so that, that's the whole idea, that, that's the whole point that I was trying to establish is the perception of the general public as healthcare workers. And I am thankful to you that, that you acknowledge that. Uh, so so the, as a healthcare worker, obviously, uh, and, and, and I, I apologize if I can't name any nurses in Pakistan because I've not been there many years now. So there are, there are nurses who are capable, they are advanced and they have advanced practice, everything. But it's the general public's perception of the, of the nurses, how we change that. The only problem is that if you ask many nurses now, when they become nurse, you ask them, what, what is your uh, uh, future ambition? Number one, I want to go abroad. And number two, I want to work in a Sarkari hospital. And so, so I work less and, 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 and uh, earn more. And uh, I, maybe I want to go to the education section sector. So that's where I said the perception is, is not changing uh, as much as we, we should have changed now, is the, how, how the patients who entered the hospital uh, gate what they see their nurses doing. That's what the perception goes to them. It's not the perception that you and I have about the nurses, it's the perception that, the, that a patient or the relative or the visitor entering the hospital, what do they see a nurse? Do they see a nurse just following a doctor and, uh, with a tray and injection? And do they see, do they call a nurse when the nurse comes in and say, okay, let me call a doctor. doctor So that, that's what the perception is. Uh, so the perception will only change when, and when, when a patient or a visitor entering the hospital, only sees a nurse and, and doesn't feel uh, feel a need of a doctor coming in. Then with, with due respect to the doctor, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that, 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 that the doctor's role should be undermined as well, but I'm saying that from the nurse's point of view, whenever a patient will see the nurse and see that they are doing something independent, the person will perception will automatically change. So, I think you. that's a very good point. Thanks, Dr. Hafiz, uh, unmute yourself. We would like to hear what you are saying. I have a question as well, please. Gigi, Oscar, Oscar, I want to say something yeah. first. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Hafiz, um, I have a question to, to uh, Brother Yasin as well as, uh, and also I would like to thank you very much that you were very successful man, that you brought uh, Dr. Yasin on this platform. You know, Dr. Faisal tried to bring him, but Dr. Faisal failed, and we tried to bring him in that uh, nurse's platform. Uh, uh, we all failed. That's why I didn't uh, recommend Yasin's name because I said if Dr. Faisal failed, how Dr. Hafiz will be <laughs> successful to bring him in this platform. That I'll tell you the whole story. I'll, I'll give you the whole yeah. story. You finish. Uh, <clears throat> that is my, uh, because the time limitation, I feel the same thing which uh, Dr. Yasin said that when I was a, uh, uh, a nurse in Aachan University Hospital, they were calling me ward boy. Even in 1992, there wasn't even nurse concept. I have to do the homeopathic medicine to be called in doctor in the society because we are we can't live beyond society. We have to live in that society. Dr. Yasin, I agree. But now we have a big responsibility and you especially, uh, 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 you know, uh, have a big role and uh, responsibility because Dr. Faisal is inviting you and we all inviting you, you know, you lead that, you know, that our nurse is a director of infection code in um, uh, United Kingdom and we are on the special uh, seats at this and we enhance their knowledge and expertise. Then, you know, the confidence only comes when you have a 
knowledge and expertise then <clears throat> uh, doctors start respecting you doctor will uh, you know uh, uh, depend on you and then he knows that what you are talking is a evidence based and this mean another thing that we don't have education and now my request is you know please accept you know our request to be a part of pakistan nursing council like you were given opportunity so that you can change in environment entirely and uh, uh, and that's why dr hafiz other day i was talking to him he said asgar we cannot see the fruits our next generation will see the fruit so we have to start at some point right. thank you very much ji ji thank you uh, thank you asgar there is a lot we are you touched my you know soft corner there um obviously we are not going we are not going to let uh, yasin by go that go that easily we have uh, you know brought him here with lot of effort uh, he showed a picture of sheikh hussain sheikh uh -huh. hussain work in my surgery and uh, obviously he when yasin was saying sheikh doesn't come and uh, speak to any doctor while treating patients is absolutely correct he's so good um, and obviously the reason of a conference like this is to bring the success stories and the leaders of in the nursing profession and what they have achieved and this is the whole aim and at uk have now raised this flag and inshallah we're going to take it forward dr noman is here as well we obviously we are we are working with him and he's going to share in terms of visa issues and the um, and all that is coming later but the the perception i think i'm fighting apps on the apps uk platform a lot i contacted all different pakistani urdu tv channels i contacted bbc urdu service i am you know whatever avenue is there we 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 went and we spoke to buzdar and i think you might remember he did a whole conference oh, sorry press conference in terms of career in nursing we our president our chair went and he spoke to imran khan when he was prime minister one to one so during last one one and a half years we have taken this flag and we what we are asking people to do is if the country had speak of this profession as a noble profession give respect then obviously people will follow and this is what prime minister has promised us obviously um, i hope he will come back and then continue the journey where he left bbc urdu service one of the pakistanis working there so i said me bbc is listened in the remote rural areas so if you produce a documentary on one of the success stories like you guys show the world what nurses can do or what they are doing and i mean i i asked geo their bureau chief came to my house and i said why don't you follow a nurse you know do a, um, uh, you know ek din geo ke sath whatever all those programs promote this profession this will benefit not only the healthcare in pakistan but also the you know the perception which we are talking you know we 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 give we highlight because people only see what they see we need to show them what they can see as a professional and inshallah we are not going to stop this journey will continue sorry i know we have pushed for time uh, hand over back to shashi can you. i just uh, have few seconds dr hafiz just just just, just to add Please. to what you already said and uh, and asghar bhai now i'm proven right because then just just to men mention you said dr faisal asked me to join pnc and i refused that i didn't refuse that for technical reason the reason was that this is the the, the political environment in pakistan is such that then any government that the government changes the people changes well so and also i i, I apologize because I, i told him i i have to learn some politics before i can join pnc because in pnc is politics more than technical nursing so uh but anyway uh, the, the, the 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 perception dr afid i just want to add again thank you very much for all the efforts you are making and and, and this is brilliant that that you are you are doing everything that you are but however i go back to the same point again that the, the prominent nurses in pakistan now if you go to the media if you go anywhere the prominent nurses are the ones who are senior nurses for, uh, who have spent time in nursing profession but you won't you won't see many nurses famous for their inventions for their any 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 anything that that make makes them prominent more than than being uh, politically and politically vet
very active or, or so 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 then th th that's where where, where I, I keep repeating the same thing that we need to have more advanced practice we need to have more advanced practice, advanced nursing co trainings courses so the universities need need to make make sure that they have they have more and more more students coming into the advanced practice so so that's how, how the perception will change we, we can make we can change the perception in the media everything we can push it but 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 pre, uh, it, it, it will take much longer than if we can have advanced practice and then, then, then and then it will automatically change, I think. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just going to go to the next speaker, um, Shahzad Akhtar. Um, he's currently working as an advanced clinical practitioner in ambulatory care unit um, as part of urgent care division at Fairfield General Hospital in Bury, Greater Manchester, UK. He obtained his primary nursing qualification from Pakistan in 2000 and then BSc with honors um, in nursing from Salford University here in England. Then he went on to, a, to do a master's program and completed MSc in advanced practice from Bolton University. His nursing career spans over 20 years with special interest in acute and coronary care, and he has held various senior clinical and management roles. My thanks for joining us today. Please unmute yourself. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, absolutely. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I think I need to share my slides so I can uh, basically talk through. Uh, I think uh, I'm unable to share them at the moment. Uh, yeah, if you look at the, the 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 menu bar at the bottom of the screen, there will be a button saying share screen. Uh, and then it will show you different boxes, which tabs where, where you can select your, can you see uh, that? Uh, it's it's in green, the bottom at the, at the bottom menu bar, there's a green button sh saying share screen on the Zoom window. Window. Um, no, I, I yeah. think uh, I think I can't see it. Second. I think it's the same line where the mute and stop video is in the same bar. So it says hide video, mute, yeah. and to your to your video. right. Carry on on the same menu bar. There will be a button saying share screen. Uh, on this, I've, I just see exit, minimize video, stop video, okay. mute video, and uh, let hide me give video. You, let me give you some. Um, um, rights, privileges, maybe. I'm not sure. Um, he has all the privileges. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I can just talk with that. I think you. I think uh, I'll probably go through the uh, my slides uh, as uh, I'm I'm just talking. So obviously, uh, obviously, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me about this little talk about my journey coming to the UK as a nurse, and um, it's an honor to give my views uh, on such a great platform where you are trying to basically help nurses mm -hmm. and basically promote or motivate them to basically explore the world. Um, and let me take the opportunity to thank the APPS organization uh, to provide such a platform for the nurses in Pakistan or working around the world. Thank you very much again. And the topic was given a couple of days ago, a few days ago, I would say, by Sheikh Hussain and Dr. Um, Hafiz uh, to talk about my journey and give some of my views in view of um, how I basically came to this country and how I progressed into, into my career. Uh, obviously, it is not an overnight work or overnight job coming through to, to this stage. Uh, it does take passion, it does take hard work, and it does take persistency, consistency to sustain and maintain your career. Uh, I'm sure it is pretty hard in Pakistan, but it is far harder in any other country. But it's achievable by working hard. So. I'm just going to uh, just tell me tell you guys about that I started to um, 
started my career in Pakistan as a very, very little operation theater technician, one year course. And then I went into do the nursing orderly course, which was a, a one year course again, after my finishing the school and started to think about that. Am I going to be like this all my life working and working hard, just working on the ward? And I realized very straight away that uh, I need to improve my education and go into a proper course. So I did FSE after that and went into general nursing diploma. Including that time period, I was working as nurse orderly and worked four years constantly studying in the day and working in the nights to support myself and my educations. Um, fortunately, in 2000, UK was very, very short for nurses and so as they are today. And I qualified in that year and I applied to basically uh, come to this country and I came to this country in 2002. Um, I started my career working in a care home. Uh, when, uh, when you complete your adaptation program, it used to be a nurses program, six months program to work and uh, get the registration with nursing and midwifery council. After working there, I realized that I can't work all my life like this. I just need to improve my knowledge, my skills, my degree, my uh, courses. So I used my cardiology experience from back home to apply in Salford Royal Foundation Trust in, uh, in, uh, in Manchester. So I'll give a little, very little uh, brief um, uh, of my interview when my manager asked me the question, that uh, why you came into nursing and why you are working here and why should we hire you? So there was a very, I had no preparation specifically for that interview. I thought that I'll go and see, and I saw a few people were being interviewed and I almost left the interview without being interviewed, uh, that uh, I wouldn't be accepted because there are like, you know, white or other people who are probably far more qualified, far more well English spoken and stuff. Um, so they won't take me. And one of the one of their um, admin staff said, now you've come from Bradford to do this interview and why don't you just conduct it and then go rather than just going without. Uh, I just listened to him and I went in the interview. And they asked me the question. I, uh, I realized that after working nine, 10 years, I wanted to, I wanted to grow. And I asked my manager that why I become, why I want, why, why I became a nurse, because our religion basically has a very, very special saying for it. And there is, uh, uh, if I'm not wrong. So if a person goes to a patient and says, how are you and how can I help you? Allah sends angels down to the floor and they pray for you. And when you are basically treating them 24 seven, you are probably swimming in the Allah's blessings. So I'm here because if I help human beings and uh, I'll, I'll be basically doing this job and I'll be basically being blessed from the Allah as well at the same time. So I'll be successful in both ways, in my religious ways, in my worldwide ways. So she was, pretty inspired by these views. And, uh, and then she asked me, what do you want to do? I said a long while ago, which was almost now 18 years ago, that I would like to do my BSc degree. I would like to do my master's degree and I would like to wear your uniform, what you're wearing today in this color. So that was, I said to her on that day, I never knew that I would be able to do that when you start your careers and stuff. So this was just a little bit of a brief view and I, kept on working, kept on running, and I got married, children, and I did my all the degrees with my children and with all the hard work of my family support and, uh, and obviously Allah's blessing. So today I'm working in a, uh, an environment where I'm working alongside with other clinicians and we work alongside exactly the similar way as other doctors are working. Obviously, it is still thousands and millions of things to learn and thousand every day we are learning and life is basically, the learning is lifelong. So, so this was my short journey sort of picture. However, looking at today's uh, scenario, like how the internationally Pakistani nurses are unable to come. I looked at the three years, last three years uh, statistics. 
112 nurses got registered on the NMC's register. And uh, in last three years, every year about 12,000 nurses came from India and uh, so on other countries like Philippines and uh, Afro-Caribbean countries. So it was so heartbreaking that why we are not basically uh, working hard enough in, in back home. I think there is another, uh, another thing which I read on the WHO's website that uh, Pakistan, from Pakistan, UK cannot recruit actively. However, the good news about the other side is but people can apply individually to, to basically go through the process of registration and uh, be able to work in this country. So to me, it was a life changing. The whole of this uh, 20 years was life changing from the day one I entered into international arena. And today it has changed my family's life, my back home family's life. I've been able to support my brothers, sisters, and they all went on to do master's degrees and, and they are well established in their lives at the moment. So that was only possible that being a nurse, I never thought, or people who are working in Pakistan, they probably aren't able to do this all. Which I basically look back and reflect back and think that if I was still in Pakistan or working in Pakistan, yes, I might would, be, would have been able to support myself, but I probably wouldn't have been able to progress into my career, like fulfill my family's needs and fulfill uh, the needs of uh, my coming nation. Uh, and in return, I think there is a benefit to all parties in view of uh, working here. Obviously, England is short for nurses and public care is being supported by the care what we are providing, number one. And we bring skills from Pakistan. We bring exactly what, we, what these people probably aren't able to produce at the minute. So they are unable to breed their own workforce because people are not ready to work in the pressure situations in, in here as well. So Pakistan is providing them. However, looking at the other side of the flip coin, that there is, uh, there is ethical issues, that in Pakistan, there is one nurse on 10,000 people. So obviously that puts pressure ethically on Pakistan's nation as well. And being, if, if UK starts recruiting actively from Pakistan, probably there would be thousands of people who will be able to come here but at the same time, we'll be starving our Pakistan own nation for, for the qualified people. So certainly, therefore, I think WHO has put a ban on um, active recruitment on agencies or NHS to, to recruit directly or in, invite people from Pakistan to work here. Certainly, it's a different uh, situation in, uh, in India and uh, probably other countries. I think there are uh, quite few countries who are in the red list at the moment where England cannot recruit. Uh, however, that's the only the bad part of it, but I completely understand we, um, my colleagues, uh, uh, Dr. Yasin and, um, and the other colleague has uh, spoke about uh, that, how, uh, how we can change the perception and stuff like that. However, I think the biggest thing what we need in Pakistan is um, they may need more school of nursing to produce more nurses and certainly I hope that we are um, we are progressed into our education in, in Pakistan, and then it will be much easier to recruit as a recruiting. Um, uh, there, there will be easier path for recruitment to to the UK. Um, now that that was just my views in in view of that. However, I can uh, go through a few steps of uh, like you know for the people who are just being qualified or the nurses who are in the final years or. Um, people who have had three years experience, they might be working in Middle East, they might be working in Pakistan in different um, uh, hospitals or regions. So NMC has given very, very easy few steps in which I think the first step, which I reflect back again on my own personal experience, uh, I used to teach on, um, uh, on one of the um, uh, mandatory training uh, teaching company. And then uh, we realized that uh, we, we can try to help people in back home. So we tried and we failed miserably. The reason, and when we did the root cause analysis for uh, that, why we failed to basically motivate or commit people to, to come over. Certainly the, there, is a, there is an educational uh, factor, which um, although there are many nursing schools are in Pakistan, which are running um, pretty well, and they are producing lots of nurses. 
However, the one thing which is missing is this English. The background for those people who are coming into nursing, again, uh, Dr. Yasin's uh, quote, I would say that the perception in, um, in, within, the, within our society is very bleak and very low in, in view of that what the nurse's career is. So therefore, the people who are coming from uh, to do the nursing training aren't really coming from the very highly uh, like standardized English, uh, English education. And when they come into nursing, therefore, they are unable to speak or gain that confidence to pass OET or pass IELTS examinations in that regard. So if we could basically intensify this English course, which you offer to people that if we can support them from here to teach them, certainly we realize that and people tried, lots of people tried and they failed, failed and failed to, to pass this English test. So if, if we can provide that sort of support in a, on a consistent basis and people who join that group and they would like to basically put or commit commit themselves to pass this exam. I think if they can pass that English exam, they can individually apply to different uh, many organizations here to, to work um, as even uh, we are restricted at the moment uh, as, a, as a country that we can't bring in people. And that is, at, if I look at the ethical sort of side, I think we can um, look at uh, producing more in Pakistan and people can apply while we are going through this turmoil of uh, our political instability and there is no money going into the, uh, into the education of nursing. Uh, I don't think so the money is going in any education in Pakistan. It's more, more or less a business. However, I think that from the government initi initiatives, uh, this can be possible that if they have uh, more workforce breeding uh, places like um, Philippine has or India has. Now India is producing so many nurses, so they are overflowing in there and therefore they are able to, to go abroad more efficiently like uh, in USA or Canada or uh, United Kingdom. Uh, and I hope that, um, uh, that if, if they can make those steps of um, improving the education in Pakistan for nurses and maybe opening more school of nursing and putting English as an essential, essential subject as uh, in year three to pass up to a certain level. And I think as soon as they pass and they can uh, probably try exploring the world uh, pretty much straight away. Uh, if I reflect back again on the, on the journey of mine, that what would I do differently if I go back and uh, I would do this advanced practice master's degree maybe 10 years ago or maybe even earlier. So I think we, we never look at our projection, we never look at our potential, we never look at, our, um, at what we can achieve. I think there are many easier ways if, if we come here and I think two years down the line after you start the career in England, you can easily go into, uh, if you're already bachelor's degree, you can uh, um, approve your degrees with the universities and you can go on to do the master's degree. So sorry for just interrupting. Please, if we could close quickly for the next speakers to come in as well. Thank you. Yes, yes. No question. <laughs> yes, no worries. So I think this is, uh, this is uh, where, where they can improve their education and go on to work on different positions, as England is still 40,000, 50,000 nurses short just within the England, and there is big shortage in, uh, around the areas. So I'll basically close here and uh, obviously our contacts are available uh, with Dr. Hafiz if any of um, um, people in Pakistan or across the uh, Middle East would like any advice or support from us, we are happy to provide that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think this is a very important thing that people are watching for them, that they have some support and guidance on which they can think about their career pathway and think about them. हमारे साथ यहां पे हैं डॉक्टर अब्दुल रहमान शाहिद जो के इमरजेंसी कंसलटेंट हैं जर्मनी में उनका बहुत सारा काम है इस सिलसिले में क्योंकि जर्मनी में भी नर्सेस बहुत ज्यादा शॉर्ट हैं और वहां पे नर्सिंग करियर आप बना सकते हैं बहुत अच्छा 
आज um, वो ऑन कॉल हैं तो uh, there, उनके कुछ टेक्निकल प्रॉब्लम्स हैं आई थिंक उनके फोन पे जिसकी वजह से वो कैमरा ऑन नहीं कर सक रहे uh, हम ट्राई कर रहे थे काफी अरसे से डॉक्टर शाहिद अगर आप सुन रहे हैं तो हमारे से बात करें जी अस्सलाम वालेकुम कैमरा मैं इसलिए ऑन नहीं कर सकता क्योंकि मैं हॉस्पिटल में हूँ यहाँ पे तो वैसे बात करने की मुझे इजाजत नहीं है लेकिन मैं ब्रेक टाइम पे बाहर आया हूँ थोड़ी टाइम के लिए ना तो आ, मैं ज्यादा नहीं सुन सका मैं तकरीबन ट्वेंटी मिनट्स पहले मैंने ज्वाइन किया था और जो मुझसे पहले स्पीकर थे मैंने इनकी बातें काफी सुनी है गौर से जैसा कि उन्होंने इंडिया के बारे में बात बताई है कि इंडिया बहुत सारी नर्सेज प्रोड्यूस कर रहा है और हमारा जो हॉस्पिटल है जर्मनी का इधर बहुत सारी इंडियन नर्सेज आई हैं रिसेंटली तकरीबन मेरे ख्याल में कोई फाइव टू टेन थाउजेंड नर्सेज जो इंडिया से जर्मनी आ चुकी हैं जर्मनी को इस वक्त तकरीबन दो से तीन लाख नर्सेज की जरूरत है और उस वजह से बहुत सारी अपॉर्चुनिटीज हैं पाकिस्तानी आ, मैं पाकिस्तानी नर्सेज की बात नहीं कर रहा मैं उन लोगों की बात कर रहा हूँ जिन्होंने एफ अभी की है पाकिस्तान में एफ किया है एफ की है यानी कि अभी स्टडी आ गया वो अभी कैरियर सोचना चाहते हैं कि हम अब किस फील्ड में जाए तो नर्सिंग जर्मनी के अंदर और यूरोप के अंदर भी स्वीडन नॉर्वे हर जगह पे जरूरत है लेकिन जर्मनी को सबसे ज्यादा जरूरत है उसके नर्सों की तो वो बहुत अच्छा कैरियर है उनका जैसे इन्होंने भाई ने कहा पहले कि एक अट्रैक्टिव जॉब है सैलरी इसकी तकरीबन स्टार्टिंग पे आठ नौ लाख रुपये से स्टार्ट होती है तो आप अपना कैरियर स्टार्टिंग से ही मतलब के बजाय इसके कि आप नर्स बनने के बाद अप्लाई करें आप पहले से ही इधर अप्लाई कर सकते हैं एप्स यूरोप की ईमेल पर रबता करें एप्स ग्लोबल हमसे आप रबता करें हम आपको उसमें गाइड करेंगे लेकिन शर्त यह है कि हम ग्रुप की सूरत में लोगों की हेल्प कर सकते हैं हम सिंगल सिंगल बंदे की हेल्प करना बहुत मुश्किल है क्योंकि हमारी अपनी भी यहाँ पर टफ जॉब्स हैं हमें जो है वो वॉल्टियरली तौर पर हम सारे काम कर रहे हैं एप्स के इस प्लेटफॉर्म पे ग्रुप की सूरत में हम बिल्कुल हेल्प करेंगे हम कोशिश करेंगे कि जो बच्चों को वहां पर 12,000 यूरोस का एक ब्लॉक अकाउंट बनवाना पड़ता है हम वो यहाँ की गवर्नमेंट से बात करके एग्जाम करवा दें हम बहुत सारी कोशिशों के लिए कर सकते हैं वीजे की हम उनको इंशाल्लाह गारंटी लेके देंगे गवर्नमेंट से पोलिटिकल कॉन्टेक्ट हैं उनको इन्वॉल्व कर सकते हैं तो एफ के बाद एफ के बाद अपना फोकस करें कि आपने यूरोप जाना है या यूके जाना है तो यूरोप जैसे यूके में रेड लिस्ट है इधर भी रेड लिस्ट है नर्सिस नहीं ले सकते हम जर्मनी में ना तो नर्सिंग से पहले ही किसी ने आना है तो यहाँ पर आके अपनी नर्सिंग की तालीम स्टार्ट करें और पर मंथ उसको तकरीबन 900 हंड्रेड यूरोज जो है वो एक स्कॉलरशिप मिलती है यानी कि वो उसको पढ़ाएंगे भी और स्कॉलरशिप भी दे रहे हैं उसको जर्मनी में दो लाख रुपये पाकिस्तानी तकरीबन दो दो ढाई लाख रुपये पहले पहले साल की दूसरे साल तीन लाख है तीसरे साल चार लाख है उसके बाद जब वो पूरी अपनी कोर्स मुकम्मल कर लेगी नर्स या कर लेगा तो उसके बाद फिर उसकी तकरीबन आठ नौ लाख रुपया फर्स्ट ईयर की सैलरी है तो मेरे ख्याल में हमें इस चांस को पाकिस्तानियों को भी या जो भी हम सुन रहे हैं इधर प्रोग्राम में हमें गाइड करना चाहिए और मिलकर हमें ग्रुप की सूरत में जो है ग्रुप बनाना चाहिए और सीनियर्स जो है वो जूनियर्स को गाइडेंस दें और जब हम एक जब हम बस 100 या 200 बच्चे जमा हो जाते हैं जो कि सिंसियर हैं और जो चाहते हैं कि हाँ हमने अपना कैरियर परस्यू करना है यूरोप में या जर्मनी में तो उनको फिर इंशाल्लाह हम ग्रुप की सूरत में वहां पर पाकिस्तान में जो जर्मन एम्बेसी है वहां पर एम्बेसर से भी हम एक रबता उनका हम अलहदा से मीटिंग कर सकते हैं और उनको हम अपने इस चैनल के और कोई इस पर कंसल्टेंसी फीस नहीं हम लेंगे कोई कंसल्टेंसी फीस में शामिल नहीं है हम एक वॉल्टियरली ऑर्गेनाइजेशन है पाकिस्तान में कोई कंसल्टेंट फीस किसी बच्चे से नहीं ली जाएगी हम बस ये चाहते हैं कि हमारे मुल्क में जो रहने वाले बेरोजगार नौजवान हैं उनको कोई तरक्की का मौका मिल सके वो भी अच्छी जिंदगी गुजार सके यहाँ पर थैंक यू थैंक यू I'm sorry we're running late a bit um so we have two more speakers to go um thanks for staying with us um next speaker is Muhammad Umar Nasir who is a physician associate based at Salford Royal Hospital Manchester United Kingdom thank you for joining us today if you unmute yourself please thanks can you all hear me yes So um, yes, yeah, so as we say, my name is uh, Umar Umar Nasir. I'm one of the physician associates. Um, and I thought it'd be a nice point today to uh, talk about what a physician associate is. Um, <clears throat> so I'm a physician associate. I've um, been working for about three years. Um, and to be a physician associate, you need an undergraduate degree and some experience in the NHS. So I've worked in the NHS before for a few years, and I used to work as a physiotherapist. Um, I went back into university. 
I studied this two years master's degree, um, which is quite intense. Um, it's like a medicine medicine degree. Some um, bits are taken out, some are condensed down um, into two years, um, and it's all full on. And once you graduate, uh, what you're able to do is you're able to assess, diagnose, and manage patients. Um, a bit like before when Dr. Yassine was uh, talking about um, advanced practitioners. Um, so at the moment, what I did myself is I went to uh, secondary care, worked in diabetes and endocrine for about a year and a half, and then from there I moved over into GP, and that's where I met Dr. Hafiz. Um, so in essence, that's what a physician associate is. Now, where they fit in the MDT um, and in the NHS can vary, um, and it depends um, how they're utilised, but uh, they normally can, they sit within the med medical team, so they'll be going on the ward rounds with the um, doctors. But the way they differ is a lot of the doctors, such as the F1s, the F2s and the SHOs, they rotate a lot on the ward. Um, and that's something that a physician associate won't be doing. Um, and that's very beneficial because it allows the physician associate to build um, quite a good link with the nursing team. Um, and then over time, once you've built that rapport and you've got the... Um, the trust in each other is a good way to communicate between the two, two teams, two teams. And I think in my previous role, um, and in my first ever role as a physician associate, that ended up being something that worked very, very well. Um, and it was a lot of support there for the nurses as well. Mm -hmm. the primary, care, the primary care is a lot smaller. So um, again, a physician associate would be taking over assessing patients and managing patients, but also providing support to the rest of the team, such as the nursing team and the pharmacy team. And this allows us all to come together and do a lot of QIPs and projects as well. Um, so in essence, that's what a physician, in essence, that's what a physician associate is. Um, I believe that this is quite a new role. So it's only in America, maybe the UK, maybe Canada. I don't think there's a, such a role in Pakistan. Would I be correct in saying that? Yes. Um, yes, I think it's even new in even within UK. It's quite a new role. I I was part of the Manchester University when this role was being developed because I was the tutor for the medical students. Um, so okay, I've been yeah. involved. Yeah, I think I've been involved uh, for, for for very long time. They didn't want to even call it physician associate. Um, that I think is an excellent uh, development in our own GP surgery. We have actually now recruited a physician associate um, in terms of, um, you know, not every single thing has to be done by the doctor apart from, you know, important decision makings. Uh, but obviously I see you, uh, you know, uh, managing the front end of the emergency department and guiding the yeah. patients in the right direction, which is, which is excellent. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so the, the course has been around in the NHS for about 10 years, but in the last three or four years, they've gave it a really big push. There's been a lot of funding from Health Education England. I think there was only about three, two or three universities in the Northwest that were doing the course compared to about seven or eight at the moment now. And like I said, from, from background, there's a lot of nurses that come into this. There's a lot of physiotherapists. There's a lot of biomedical scientists. Um, and because we've all got that experience in the NHS and we've got that background in health sciences, we do this condensed degree over two years and it allows us to support the medical and the nursing team a lot more. Um, and it's quite enjoyable as well because there's no, at the moment, because it's a new course and it's been developed, there's no scope. So as long as you've got, I mean, there's no ceiling. There is a scope of practice, but there's no ceiling. As long as you've got somebody willing to support you, a consultant or a GP, you, you know, you can learn new skills, you can get signed up in new skills. Um, I believe there's some physician associates involved in surgery, involved in endoscopy, um, as in long working. That's because they managed to get that support there. Um, so I'm just going to keep it quick because I know we're running out of time. But okay, thank you. Thank you. Physician associate is. Um, what the future looks like for us at the moment, and um, we are waiting for regulation. Uh, as we're not regulated, we have a voluntary register, which means that at the moment, unfortunately, we can't independently prescribe. Um, hopefully by next year, the plan is that the GMC, so the General Medical Council, will be taking over us and then there'll be a pathway set to how we'll end up or how we'll be able to prescribe soon. Uh, so that's something that we're all looking forward to. Um, and inshallah, it doesn't take too long. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our last speaker today is Dr. Noman Ehsan, who is a <laughs> 
and the Chief Executive of MediScan Diagnostic Services Limited. Thank you for being here with us on Saturday. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Afiz and other people. Um, it was a very nice uh, conference and I, I'm proud of it. You can people hear me properly? Yes, that's okay. right. Uh, I have been hearing a lot in, so let me speak in Urdu because all the people are from Pakistan as well, am I right? Yes. That's right, but we'll have a recording yes, 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 for it. Yes. Yeah. So just, uh, I'm a consultant radiologist, work in Blackpool Hospital, as well as I have my own business, which is called MediScan Diagnostic Services, uh, where we provide services to the NHS in different sectors. We have provided clinics in about one third of England. So just to, exp uh, to help you how the nurses can be helped in Pakistan, जो मैंने लर्न किया यहाँ वो ये कि जैसे डॉक्टर्स ने बाकी नर्सेज ने बताया कि डायरेक्टली तो आप नर्सेज को नहीं ला सकते उसमें एक डिफिकल्टी है लेकिन जो अदर वे है अराउंड इज कि हम हेल्थ केयर असिस्टेंट्स के तौर पे हम नर्सेज को ला सकते हैं मैंने बिफोर द कोविड पाकिस्तान में एडवर्टाइज की जॉब इन टू द न्यूज और थ्रू ए रिक्रूटमेंट एजेंसी जो कराची से मैंने एक हायर की थी और हमने इंटरव्यूज लाहौर इस्लामाबाद और कराची में किए उसमें तकरीबन हमने 150 नर्सेज को इंटरव्यू किए मैं बहुत खुश हुआ एक्चुअली के जी नर्सेज और वेरी वेरी क्वालिफाइड कई लड़कियां आई जिन्होंने एमबीए भी किया हुआ था कई लड़कियां थी जिनका आयल्स उस वक्त आयल्स भी किया हुआ था और सिक्स प्लस स्कोर भी था विच वॉज वेरी वेरी गुड स्कोर एंड आई वॉज वेरी हैप्पी ऑन दैट तो आई वॉन्ट टू हेल्प पाकिस्तान क्योंकि अपना हम वहां से आए हैं और अब एक दूसरे को हेल्प करना चाहते हैं तो मैंने इन, मेरे पास हैं वीजर्स फॉर देम तो मैंने इनको हायर किया एज हेल्थ केयर असिस्टेंट्स और मैं पाकिस्तान से इनिशियली तीन से पांच लोगों को मैंने पहले ट्रायल बेसिस पे लाया था कि यहाँ मैं लाऊं और उसके बाद हम उनको फर्दर मूव ऑन करें जो मैं आप लोगों को हेल्प गाइड कर जाता हूँ उसमें दो तीन चीजें हैं कि आप हेल्थ केयर असिस्टेंट वीजा पे यहाँ आ जाते हैं बड़े आराम से उसके बाद आपको एक साल मिलता है कि आपने अपने एग्जाम्स आप यहाँ से पास कर लें जिसमें ई ये जो इंग्लिश एग्जाम है वो आपने करना है उसके बाद जो है ना वो लड़की या लड़का जो भी है वो अपने आप को नर्सिंग काउंसिल के साथ रजिस्टर कर लेता है और उसको पिन नंबर मिल जाता है वंस पिन नंबर मिल जाता है तो वो शी कैन शी और ही कैन गो ईजिली टू द हॉस्पिटल और डिफरेंट एरियाज जो मेरे पास आई हैं लड़कियां उन्होंने दोनों ने तीन आई थी एक तो विद इन आई थिंक अकेली थी तो विद इन टू थ्री मंथ्स वो वापस पाकिस्तान चली गई और मैं इसमें आपको बताऊंगा भी कि एम्प्लॉयर की तरफ से क्या प्रॉब्लम्स हो सकते हैं जो पाकिस्तानी जब लोगों को हायर करते हैं तो क्या प्रॉब्लम्स होते हैं जबकि अगर हम चाहे अगर हम फिलिपीन से हायर करते हैं तो क्या डिफ्रेंसिस हैं क्योंकि एम्प्लॉयर डिफरेंट एंगल से देखता है जब वो पाकिस्तान जाता है जैसे मैं जाता हूं तो वो तो अपने मुल्क के जाता है कि हम अपने मुल्क में अपने लोगों को हेल्प करते हैं लेकिन आप लोगों को भी अपने आप को इम्प्रूव करना पड़ेगा हम एज ए पाकिस्तानी नेशन कि हम क्या क्या चीजें दूसरे एम्प्लॉयर के लिए प्रॉब्लम ना करें एग्जाम्पल मैं आपको बताता हूँ कि हमारे लोग बहुत मेहनती हैं लेकिन एक तो प्रॉब्लम होता है ड्राइविंग का कि जितनी भी लड़कियाँ आती हैं मेजोरिटी को ना ड्राइविंग नहीं आती और डिपेंडेंट होती हैं ऑन समवन उनको कोई लेके आए उनको लेके जाए जबकि अगर आप फिलिपींस की एग्जांपल देखें तो उनको आप अगर क्लिनिक बता दें कि अगर ये क्लिनिक है तो वो खुद ही अपनी ट्रेन वगैरह ढूंढ के पहुंच जाती हैं जबकि पाकिस्तानी लड़की जो है वो उसके लिए काफी मुश्किल होती हैं वो कई दफा शुरू शुरू में तीन चार महीने उसके लिए ना स्ट्रगलिंग होता है कि वो एडजस्ट सोसाइटी में करें क्योंकि उसने पाकिस्तान में ये चीज नहीं की होती पाकिस्तान में जो हम देखते हैं कि लड़कियां हैं तो उसके कोई बहन या कोई भाई या कोई वालिद कोई ना कोई बंदा उसको लेके जा रहा है उसको छोड़ने जा रहा है उसको हेल्प दे रहा है तो यहाँ आके वो स्ट्रगल करती हैं तो मेरी सजेशन होगी कि हम जो है ना अपने आप को थोड़ा सा ग्रूम करें वेन हम इंटरनेशनल सोसाइटी में जाते हैं तो हमें इंटरनेशनली डिफरेंट एंगल से प्ले करना पड़ता है तो अपने आप को इस पर एक तो ड्राइविंग हमें जो है ना वहाँ सीखनी चाहिए ताकि जब यहाँ आए क्योंकि हॉस्पिटल्स में जाना आसान होता है क्योंकि हॉस्पिटल्स हर जगह 
वहाँ एक्सेस इजी है लेकिन जो केयर होम्स हैं उनमें जो इनिशियल जॉब्स होती है ना वो हेल्थ केयर असिस्टेंट के तौर पे आप उनको केयर होम्स में देते हैं या आप जीपी सर्जरीज में दे सकते हैं उनको तो उसमें जो ना ट्रैवल करना पड़ता है उनको सिस्टम फॉलो करना पड़ता है तो इसलिए आई वुड सजेस्ट कि जो भी इंग्लैंड या यूरोप आना चाहता है वो काइंडली ड्राइविंग का एक लाइस वहाँ जरूर ड्राइविंग लर्न करे और ड्राइविंग सीखे मैं आपको ये भी बताऊंगा कि हम अनफॉर्चुनेटली हमारे लोग झूठ बोलते बहुत है मैंने जब इंटरव्यूज में लिया तो मैंने यही बात हमेशा में पूछता था कि ड्राइविंग आती है तो एक लड़की ने कहा जी मैं तो 130 पे चलाती हूँ गाड़ी मोटरवे पे इस्लामाबाद कराची में लाहौर में मैंने कहा ठीक है जब वो यहाँ आई तो पता चला उसे गाड़ी आती नहीं थी चलानी <laughs> तो मैंने कहा वो एक की स्पीड कहाँ गई जो तुम चलाती थी तो वो फिर मतलब वो आए बाई करने लगी बहरल इसलिए मैं जनरल बात कर रहा हूँ कि हम लोग जब आए तो ड्राइविंग सीखें और ये कोई मुश्किल काम नहीं है ड्राइविंग जरूर सीख के आए उनके लिए इन्हीं के लिए आसानी होगी दूसरा ये हेल्थ केयर असिस्टेंट वीजा एडवांटेज ये है कि ये पूरी फैमिली का वीजा मिलता है इसमें आप अकेले भी आ सकते हैं और अपनी अपने बच्चों के साथ अपने हस्बैंड के साथ और या अपने वाइफ के साथ आप पूरी फैमिली आके सेटल हो सकती है एक बहुत अच्छी अपॉर्चुनिटी है जिसके तहत पाकिस्तान एक की पूरी फैमिली आके यहाँ सेटल हो जाती है और इंग्लैंड में एडवांटेज ये है कि यहाँ हेल्थ और एजुकेशन टोटली फ्री है तो जब आप लोग आते हैं तो आपकी वो भी कॉस्ट नहीं पड़ती कि आपके ऊपर हेल्थ के ऊपर या बच्चों के एजुकेशन के ऊपर तो ये भी एक बहुत बड़ा एडवांटेज मिलता है तीसरी चीज़ ये है कि जब आप यहाँ आ जाते हैं जैसे मैं यहाँ क्या करता हूँ कि जब भी मैं चीज़ को आता हूँ तो मैंने ड्राइविंग इंस्ट्रक्टर्स रखे हुए हैं नॉट ऑन माई जॉब लेकिन मैंने कंपनी से बात की है तो वो उन लड़कों या लड़कियों को कोई दस लेसन देते हैं ड्राइविंग इंस्ट्रक्टर के हाउ टू ड्राइव इन यू के दैट हेल्प दम ए लॉट टू गिव दम ए गाइडेंस इनिशियली इन एडिशन हम जब लाते हैं तो हम यहाँ एकोमोडेशन भी देते हैं फॉर फर्स्ट वन मंथ ताकि वो लोग यहाँ सेटल हो जाए क्योंकि इस मुल्क में जब भी आएंगे तो आपको कोई भी छः महीने जब भी एकोमोडेशन लेनी पड़ेगी तो छः महीने की एकोमोडेशन आपको लेनी पड़ती है उससे कम जो है ना कोई टेनेंसी एग्रीमेंट साइन नहीं करता तो हमने ऐसे हेल्प की थी लोगों को कि हम एक महीने हमने फ्लैट्स लिए हुए थे तो हम उनको एक महीने के लिए दे देते थे एंड देन दे कैन ग्रेजुअली सेटल वेयर दे वेयर वर दे गो ये तो एक जनरल गाइडेंस है कि यहाँ आके क्या होता है इसके अलावा ओ आप अगर आपने पाकिस्तान से आइल्स पास कर लिया है और अपना रिक्वायर्ड स्कोर नर्सिंग के हिसाब से ले लिया है तो आप वो जल्दी एग्जाम पास कर लोगे लेकिन आपके पास अनफ टाइम होता है कि जब आप यहाँ वीजे पे आ जाते हो हेल्थ केयर असिस्टेंट के तौर पे तो आपको साल आराम से मिलता है और उसके बाद भी वो वीजा एक्सटेंड हो जाता है तो ये इशू नहीं है मैं आप तमाम लोगों को कहूँगा माशा सारे पाकिस्तान में नर्सेज बहुत मेहनती हैं हमने उनके साथ पाकिस्तान में भी काम किया मैं पहले आग खान में था उससे पहले मैं निश्तर मेडिकल कॉलेज में था और मैं हेड ऑफ द डिपार्टमेंट भी था निश्तर में और बका यूनिवर्सिटी में भी हेड ऑफ द डिपार्टमेंट रहा मैं तो पाकिस्तान में डॉक्टर अदीब रिजवी एस आई यू टी में मैंने काम किया तो हमारी नर्सिस माशाल्लाह बहुत मेहनती हैं बहुत कैलिबर की हैं मैं इनको कहूँगा कि मेहनत करें और यहाँ बहुत पोटेंशियल है इंग्लैंड में यूरोप में इसको ज़रूर अवेल करें अपॉर्चुनिटी को और इस तरह आप दस से लोगों को दस अपनी फैमिलीज को हेल्प आउट कर सकते हैं एक नॉर्मल सिनेरियो ये काउंट किया जाता है कि अगर एक फैमिली मेंबर अगर आता है यूरोप में तो वो कम से कम 20 फैमिली मेंबर्स को सपोर्ट करता है अपने मुल्क में डायरेक्टली और इनडायरेक्टली वो कुछ लोग उसको उनको हेल्प करता है कुछ लोग उससे इंस्पायर होके एक रास्ता लेते हैं ये एग्जांपल है जब इंग्लैंड में नाइनटीन में लोग आए पाकिस्तान में मंगला डैम की वजह से और मूवमेंट हुई तो आप देखें पाकिस्तानी उस वक्त ट्वेंटी आए थे अब मेरा ख्याल है टू मिलियन है तो एक इंस्पायरेशन होती है उस एरिया में उस इलाके से बाकी रिश्तेदारों को तो इसलिए इस अपॉर्चुनिटी को जरूर अवेल करें हम लोग अब्दुल हफीज आपके साथ माशाल्लाह हैं मैं भी आपके साथ अवेलेबल हूँ जब आपको जो हेल्प चाहिए हम आप हेल्प करेंगे बल्कि हम इनशाला जल्दी पाकिस्तान में दोबारा रिक्रूटमेंट करेंगे और वी विल लाइक टू मीट ऑल यू गाइज और वहाँ यहाँ जो है ना हम मेरा ख्याल है हफीज जैसे कहा कि इंग्लिश कोर्स में ही इज़ हैप्पी टू सपोर्ट ऑल ऑफ यू गाइस तो जो भी हम मेरी तरफ से सपोर्ट चाहिए होगी एज ए कंपनी एज ए डॉक्टर वट एवर इट इज तो आई फाइनेंशियली और नॉन फाइनेंशियली वी विल ऑलवेज सपोर्ट डॉक्टर हफीज एंड एपीपीएस एंड ऑल ओवर पाकिस्तानीज जो इसमें करना चाहते हैं अगर कोई आपको इशू है कोई हेल्प चाहिए मजीद 
تو میں آپ کو ہمارے پاس جو نرسیز آئی ہیں شگفتہ ہے یہاں ایک اور فاطمہ ہے ان تو ان سے بھی کنیکٹ کر دوں گا ابھی ہم نے آغ خان سے دو لڑکیاں لی ہیں جو جنہوں نے جوائن کیا ہے یہاں تو اگر آپ لوگوں کو ضرورت ہوگی تو میں ان لوگوں سے کنیکٹ بھی کر دوں گا دے ول گائڈ یو پراپرلی تو آئی تھنک میں نے کافی ٹائم لے لیا ہے اگر کوئی اور چیز آپ سمجھتے تو میں آپ کو مزید گائڈ کر دیتا ہوں ویزا پروسیس بہت ایزی ہے وہ بھی بتا دیتا ہوں کہ جب آپ کو یہاں ہم اسپانسر ویزا دیتے ہیں تو ہم یہاں ہوم آفس سے آپ کا ویزا جنریٹ کرتے ہیں ہوم آفس اس کے بعد آپ نے صرف پاکستان میں دو چیزیں کروانی ہوتی ہیں ایک آپ نے ان کی ڈیزائرڈ لیبارٹریز ہوتی ہیں لاہور کراچی اور اسلام آباد میں اور اس میں ایکس رے ہوتا ہے اور ایک بلڈ ٹیسٹ ہوتا ہے وہ اور اپنے ڈاکومنٹس آپ برٹش ایمبیسی کو جمع کراتے ہیں آپ کا ویزا ود ان فور ویکس لگ جاتا ہے اور جب ویزا لگتا ہے اس کی ریکوائرمنٹ یہ ہوتی ہے کہ ود ان ون منتھ آپ نے یو کے میں لینڈ کرنا ہوتا ہے اگر آپ اس کو ون منتھ کو اویل نہیں کریں گے تو وہ آپ کا ویزا ضائع ہو سکتا ہے دوسری بات ہے کہ انیشلی جو ویزا لگتا ہے وہ تین سال کے لیے لگتا ہے اور تین سال کے بعد وہ ایکسٹینڈ ہو جاتا ہے فار انادر تھری ایئرس جس میں پورا ٹائم جو ہے نا کمپلیٹ ہو جاتا ہے فار فار دا پیریڈ تو اور یہ آٹومیٹکلی پانچ سال بعد چھ سال بعد یہ آپ کا پاسپورٹ میں کنورٹ ہو جاتا ہے ود آل فیسلٹیز جو آپ اویل کرتے ہیں آئی تھنک دس از انف فار فرام مائی سائڈ جی 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 تھینک یو جو بھی ہوتا ہے وہ دونوں آ سکتے ہیں ہم نے جو سلیکٹ کیے تھے پاکستان میں لڑکے بھی سلیکٹ کیے تھے اور لڑکیاں بھی سلیکٹ کی تھی ہم لڑکیاں پہلے اس لیے لائے تھے کہ ایسے میں ڈیزائن میں بتاتا ہوں ہم پاکستان سے کوئی پچاس فیملیز لائے ہیں تو اس میں ہم ڈاکٹرز بھی لائے ٹیکنیشینس بھی لائے سونوگرافرز بھی لائے تو سونوگرافرز کیونکہ بہت سارے جو تھے وہ فیمیلز تھیں تو جب آپ ان کے ساتھ اسسٹنٹ لگاتے ہیں تو آپ کو میز لگا سکتے ہیں لیکن اگر آپ کے ساتھ سونوگرافرز میل ہیں تو یو ہیو ٹو پٹ فیمیلز نو تھینک یو جسٹ آن لائٹ نوٹ کیا وہ صرف لڑکیوں کا ریفرنس دے رہے تھے بٹ مائی ایک کلیریفیکیشن ہے جسٹ وانٹ ٹو کلیریفائی اور ہوپ فلی یہ ہیلپ فل ہوگا لوگوں کے لیے پیپل ہو آر لیونگ ان دا مڈل ایسٹ تو ان کو پاکستان کا لیکن جو مڈل ایسٹ میں لوگ رہتے ہیں ان کے لیے دیر از نو ریسٹرکشن ٹو اپلائی ڈائریکٹلی ان کو کوئی ہیلتھ کیئر اسسٹنٹ یا کسی کے تھرو آنے کی بھی ضرورت نہیں ہے ایگزامپلس مجھے کوئی زیادہ عرصہ نہیں ہوا ایک سال پہلے میں آیا ہوں تو اگر کوئی انڈیویجول مڈل ایسٹ میں رہ رہا ہے اور یہاں پہ ہاسپٹل میں یا کہیں سے بھی اس کو اسپانسر ویزا ملتا ہے تو دے کین اپلائی ڈائریکٹلی ایز اے نرس دیر از نو نیڈ ٹو 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 اپلائی ایز اے ہیلتھ کیئر اسسٹنٹ ان کے پاس انگلش ایگزام ہونا چاہیے میرے اگین میرے میری یونیک ایگزامپل ہے کہ میری ڈگریز انگلش میں ہیں تو مجھے ضرورت نہیں تھی سو ایف یو ہیو انگلش ایگزام اینڈ یو ہیو اسپانسر اسپانسر سرٹیفکیٹ فرام اینی اینی ہاسپٹل این ایچ ایسٹرا سو اینی ہاسپٹل وچ وچ از رجسٹرڈ یو ڈونٹ نیڈ ٹو اپلائی ایز ہیلتھ کیئر اسسٹنٹ آپ ڈائریکٹ نرس کے ویزے کے اوپر بھی آ سکتے ہیں اور آئی ایم ون آف دا ایگزامپل تو اس لیے کوئی آپ کو ضرورت نہیں ہیلتھ کیئر اسسٹنٹ کے ویزے پہ آنے کی ڈو ناٹ سیل یور سیلف چیپلی اگر آپ کوالیفائڈ ہیں انگلش آپ کے ایگزام دیا ہوا ہے تو آپ اپلائی کر سکتے ہیں اگر فردر گائیڈنس کسی کو بھی چاہیے تو یو کین کانٹیکٹ می آلویز جو آپ نے یاسین بات کی نا پاکستان سے تو پاکستان سے مجھے جو آپ کہیں نرسز الاؤڈ نہیں ہے تو اس میں پھر یہ لوگ ہیلتھ ہیلتھ کیئر اسسٹنٹ کے طور پہ آ سکتے ہیں لیکن دیکھیں یہ بات نہیں ہے ایشو یہ ہے کہ جب تک وہ یہاں کا پن نمبر نہیں لیں گے اس وقت تک وہ نرس کے طور پہ یہاں کام نہیں کر سکتے ہیں مائی رائٹ جی ڈاکٹر رومان یہ ہے کہ وہ یہاں پہ جیسے میرا ہاسپٹل ہے نا جہاں میں اس وقت جاب کر رہا ہوں تو یہاں پر وہاں سے نرس ڈائریکٹ بھی یا انڈیویجول بھی لے کر آتے ہیں تو وہاں سے ویزا نرس کا ہی ویزا ملتا ہے یہاں پہ آ کے تو وہ انگلش ایگزام پہلے ہی ہوتا ہے ایک اور فردر مجھے اس کا نام بھول گیا اس ایگزام کا وہ ہاسپٹل سپورٹ کرتا ہے وہ ان کو ہاسپٹل ان کو یہاں پہ اکوموڈیشن دیتا ہے ان کو سیلری دیتا ہے ان کو سپورٹ کرتے ہیں ایگزام کے لیے ایونس یو پاس دیٹ ایگزام تو پھر آپ رجسٹر ہو جاتے ہیں لیکن وہ آ سکتے ہیں ویزا لے کر آ سکتے ہیں جی جی میں آپ کو دیکھیں ہاں میں یہی بتانا چاہتا ہوں 
کہ جب تک کیونکہ میں اس پروسیس سے گزرا ہوں ایز این امپلائر کہ جب آپ وہاں سے لے بھی آئے ہیں ان کو وہ آپ رجسٹرڈ آپ ہاسپٹل نے اکوموڈیشن بھی دے دی ہے اور آپ کو کام بھی دے دی ہے لیکن ایون ٹل دیٹ ٹائم آپ نرس نہیں ہیں انگلینڈ میں نرس آپ جب ہی ہوں گے انہوں نے جب آپ کا یہاں کا پاس ہو جائے گا ایگزام اور یہاں نرسنگ کونسل میں آپ رجسٹر ہو جائیں گے آپ کو پن نمبر مل جائے گا جیسے ڈاکٹرز کا ہے جب تک جی ایم سی نہیں ملتا جب تک ڈاکٹرز ریکگنائز نہیں ہوتے اسی طرح نرسز کا ہے تو جو ہاسپٹلس لا رہے ہیں نا وہ وہی لا رہے ہیں جیسے میں لے کے آیا تھا دیٹ از دا سیم پروسیس کہ ہم نے ان کو لائے ہیلتھ کیئر اسسٹنٹ کے طور پہ لیکن اس کے بعد ان کو ود ان ود ان ون ایئر ان کو ٹائم دیا گیا کہ وہ پاس کر لیں جیسے وہ پاس کر لیں گے اب وہ کوئی ون منتھ میں کر لیتا ہے ٹو منتھ میں کر لیتا ہے یہ تو اس کے اوپر ہے نا لیکن جیسے ہی وہ پاس کر لیتا ہے وہ نرس کے طور پہ رجسٹر ہو جاتا ہے لیکن یہ اس لیے میں نے راستہ آپ کو بتایا ہے جو ہیلتھ کیئر اسسٹنٹ والا کہ آپ آ کے ہیلتھ کیئر اسسٹنٹ کام کریں اور جب آپ کا نرسنگ پاس ہو جائے دین یو موو ان ٹو یور نرسنگ پارٹ دس از آلویز اے اسٹیپ ان لائک دا سیم وے آپ پاکستان سے مڈل ایسٹ جاتے ہیں اور مڈل ایسٹ سے پھر آپ یورپ یا امریکہ وغیرہ میں نکل جاتے ہیں دس از اے اسٹیپ ان تو اسی طرح آپ کو ایک فیسلٹی مل رہی ہے ڈائریکٹلی آنے کی تو اس کو یوٹیلائز کریں اٹ اٹ ول ناٹ ٹیک لانگ ود ان ون ایئر یو ول بی ان یور رائٹ ٹریک اور جیسے یہ بات کر رہے ہیں اسپیشلائزیشن آپ کریں یو ہیو یو ہیو لاٹ آف اپورچونیٹیز فار اسپیشلائزیشن ان ڈفرینٹ پارٹ آف نرسنگ اینڈ دیٹ یو ول گیٹ ان یو کے لاٹ اینڈ یورپ بیسٹ وشیز آل آف یو گائز جی 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 تھینک یو um i think the the the, the reason we um, obviously invited dr noman is um because number one nhs hospitals uh, follow the who guidance and there are people who contact us but hospital says because you are on the red list we can't recruit you so the, 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 the there is a lot of restriction and big numbers can't come the advantage of coming through any bypass route or if there is any because dr noman isan has the license to issue visas okay and not many people have it so this is the advantage which we has as apps as an organization that we are linked with the person who actually doesn't need to ask anyone else he can actually issue the certificate for the visa and you can come as a nurse you can come as a, phys- a physiotherapist you can come as a sonographer i mean the, 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 there is no restriction on the license which noman has and obviously me and noman went to a uh, law Two, two years ago and we obviously interviewed uh, some people um, there as well and we are again looking for more opportunities if any hospital um, give you a job or you can contact us for the uh, for the visa part we can actually um, support you but this is obviously our effort to work together in terms of wherever whichever route whichever easy you know ways are there they are all open for you and um, obviously you options are there you you choose what is most suitable what is best um, and inshallah we will continue working on that rifat is ji rifat begum hamare sath hain aap sawal karna chahti hain aapka camera nahi hai is waqt hon lekin agar aap hame sun sakti hain to sawal kare please yeah there you are rifat begum awaaz nahi aa rahi hai aapki aapka wo audio connected nahi hai is time اگر آپ ٹائپ کرنا چاہتی ہیں اپنا سوال تو کر لیں ورنہ پھر ہم انتظار کرتے ہیں اتنی دیر میں جی عبد الحفیظ صاحب جی جی آئی تھنک وی وی آر 20 منٹس 25 منٹس اوور آئی تھنک وی شوڈ موو ٹوڈس کلوزر سو اف دیر از اینی کوسچن اوبیسلی وی ہیو گیون این ای میل ان دی چیٹ یو کین کانٹیکٹ اس آن آن دیٹ چینل اور ٹیلی فون نمبرز ور آن دی پوسٹ سو انشاءاللہ وی ول کم بیک اینڈ کنیکٹ یو انشاءاللہ Uh, with more opportunities thank you thank you we'll come back next year with more exciting talks and we're always here for um, any support and guidance so do contact us if you want to do that yeah. have a great weekend and thank you and to all the speakers panelists and the viewers allah hafiz thank you allah hafiz thank you thank you thank you, thank you.